right. Well, um, I'm showing uh, 11.31 and a half, so uh, close enough to 11.30, I guess, to, uh, to, to get started, Matthias. Uh, what do you think, Randy? Let's go. All right. So um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make a couple of very brief comments and then hand it over to Matthias for for the the true wisdom. Um, we've been we've been trying to have this session for a long time, and and I, I see Bruce Carmichael's name on the list. Good morning, Bruce. Uh, literally, when when Bruce was still running FPA and. You know the the rest of us were were uh, you know attending and and helping out. Um, uh, you know th this came up in in his tenure, and that was several years ago now that <laughs> that this first came came up and and we attempted to to make it happen. And um, you know a a series of events that that we had little or no control over took place. And and um, the the kind of dilemma that Matthias and Randy and 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 the other organizers and I found ourselves in is uh, was that that although it seemed at one point in time like it was a fairly sure bet that we'd be able to meet in person this fall as events have unfolded uh, that became a very questionable. Um, um, Strategy and so uh, literally at at for what us was the the last minute or maybe even arguably past the last minute we decided to go all virtual so so this meeting is about three years in the making it's supposed to have been in person but it's unfortunately going to be virtual so we're going to do the best um, that we can to 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 make that happen in a meaningful way um, in in order to to attempt to do so. And if you are are so inclined, I would encourage people when you are speaking um, to turn on your cameras so that people can see you and attach a face to a name if they don't already know you. And and um, you know we'll make this as in personish as we possibly can. Um, and so I'll I'll stop babbling there and hand it over to Matthias for all the the really good stuff. I don't know what you're talking about because Randy will talk about the good stuff. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Well, how about the administrative stuff? Yeah, so again, uh, from my side also, welcome to the uh, Fall 21 FPA meeting. Uh, uh, as Matt said, this has been uh, in preparation for quite a while, and we are happy that it actually is happening now. And the people you see listed there on the slide, Randy Bass, Nancy Mendonca, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Branham, Jeffrey Weinrich, Matt and I were sort of the, the heavy lifter in orchestrating the next four days, what you will see. And Matt, if you go to the next slide, that would be great. Uh, it will be four days, uh, Monday through Thursday. Uh, it will be the same time frame from 11.30 a.m. till about 4 p.m. Eastern, and the meeting uh, will be recorded. Click one more time, Matt, please. This is a very high-level uh, agenda, which you have seen based on the email distribution or if you visited the FPA website. It gives you just an idea of what we will be touching base in the next four, day, four days. Today is kind of reviewing the traditional aviation weather space, what's going on in the different uh, parts of the federal agencies. Then tomorrow we will delve into aviation weather for advanced air mobility operations. Uh, there's a lot of uh, buzz that you hear around and read about uh, from the aviation industry news outlets about drone operations, urban air mobility, etc. And we will really delve into that tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, uh, October 6, will be a, a little bit of mixture of different things that are other aspects that may be relevant and happening out there, multi-use, 
whether that could be brought to bear on the aviation or the aviation industry could benefit from those kinds of things. Commercial no. space we talk a little bit about and looking into the future, how the weather uh, for aviation will look like in the future. And then the fourth day will particularly be a recap, rethinking of what we have heard in these first three days and look for synergies, uh, opportunities to collaborate and take it to the next level. And if that's not good enough, then you have an opportunity on October 20th to get engaged in the planning meeting where we look at the spring meeting, what we will talk about then, and an early look at the fall meeting a year from now. If you click one more time, Matt, just a little bit of bookkeeping. Please mute your microphones if you don't speak. That really helps with minimizing background noise and uh, help us focus on hearing the, the speakers and what they have to say. If you want to contribute something, whether it's a comment or a question, please use the chat room and type it in there. And we have uh, people monitoring the chat room. I think it's David Strand today, if that's correct. Yeah, I see Matt is, is nodding. So we have someone, uh, David, monitoring the chat room and at the appropriate times, he will stop us and say, wait a minute, we have some important questions or comments here. And if needed for clarification, we can always have the person who submitted the comment or question uh, elaborate more uh, by voice directly uh, and so this is the way we have been doing it in the past and it really worked well. The, the chat room uh, has taken on its own life. People have been you know, exchanging thoughts and comments there. And so I think this will work again very well uh, for the next four days. And with that, I really wanna hand it over to Randy Bass who orchestrated the first day. So Randy, please take it from here, thank you. All right, thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Matt, and uh, to the other uh, uh, folks who uh, put this together. Um, it's uh, like Matt said, uh, it, it's been it's been planned for about three years, and then uh, last about it, oh, uh, um, not quite a year ago is when we really started the uh, uh, planning, trying to put this together, and. Um, as you said, we've uh, we've had a lot of uh, bumps and and restarts along the way, and finally we just decided, you know what, let's go ahead and and do it now. Um, so I want to thank all the uh, participants who have joined us uh, today, both uh, within the uh, federal uh, government and outside of it. I think what you'll uh, uh, hopefully you'll get a lot out of this and and learn a lot of things, and and I know I've learned a lot just uh, collecting all the information from folks. So. Uh, the first thing we want to do is, uh, um, you know, actually, first thing I'm going to do is put up the agenda for today. And hopefully everybody can see that. The uh, So what we have planned for today uh, kind of as a kickoff, uh, Dave Charney is going to uh, provide an overview of the new uh, Inter Interagency Council on the Advancement of Meteorological Services called ICAMS. Uh, some of you are uh, probably familiar with uh, uh, the old uh, OFCM, the Office of the Federal Coordinator for uh, Meteorology. Um, ICAMS is, is going to be doing a lot of that plus more. So uh, uh, Dave will uh, give us an overview on that. Uh, then we are going to start with the first of three uh, panel sessions today. Um, you'll notice that we're really trying to stay away from death by PowerPoint, so we don't want to just uh, go and give you uh, one after another of, of you know, presentations by uh, folks on what they do or what they want to do or things like that. So we're going to try to make this a lot more interactive. So we're going to uh, this first uh, panel is on the operations and the and uh, what we do today. 
So it's uh, kind of the current uh, weather support aviation operations. Uh, you see the panelists there and I'll introduce each of them as we uh, get to that. Uh, we'll take about a 30 minute break afterwards so the folks on the East Coast can take a late lunch uh, break. Uh, Central and, and Mountain Time can have a uh, kind of an early lunch or right on time lunch. And the folks in uh, the West Coast and Alaska, um, oh, you can have breakfast, I guess, at that time. Uh, afterwards, we're going to come back and we're going to do uh, the research and uh, research development and transition to operations uh, that, uh, that's going on now. And then finally, uh, after another uh, a quick break, we're going to talk about governance and the uh, the guidelines and policies that that drive today's uh, uh, weather support. Um, that will pretty much wrap up day one, and and uh, we'll uh, do a quick uh, quick highlight and and maybe preview preview tomorrow's agenda. So uh, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. And let me uh, bring up Dave's presentation here. And I promise I do have it. <laughs> Just as a history for everybody to let you know how old Randy and I are. We we were in the Air Force together and I was working under him in 1997 back at Ellsworth Air Force Base. That's true. It has been quite a while. So uh all right. Hold on just one second. Um so yeah, let me let me introduce Dave. Um, again, we've uh, we, we've known each other for a long time. Um, Dave's a 28-year retired lieutenant colonel from the uh, Air Force Reserves and a combat weather weather veteran. He's worked with the uh, National Weather Service for almost 20 years and is a, uh, a tropical expert who worked at the uh, National Hurricane Center. He's currently the senior meteorologist on staff at the uh, at OFCM. Um, which is becoming the Interagency Meteorological Coordination Office under the new ICAMS. And um, most people don't know, and in fact, I didn't know this, even though I've known him for a long time. Uh, he's also a pilot, so that uh, hopefully makes him a better aviation meteorologist. And if nothing else, he probably pays more attention to the weather than most other pilots do when he's, uh, uh, hopefully when he's uh, flight planning. So, uh, um, Dave, go ahead and uh, let me put this in presentation mode. All righty. All right, Thanks there you go. That. Thanks for that introduction. So, okay, why don't we go to the next slide here? All right, so what is ICAMS? Um, well, it kind of got to go back. So, back a couple years ago, I think it was 2017, the, the Weather Act came out. And Congress said, we need to look at how we do things. Now, OFCM, we've been around for over 50 years. And to tell you the truth, I thought we did a pretty good job. Uh, but obviously, with every organization, you can always reevaluate and see what you could do better. And the big thing with ICAMS, what it's trying to do is get senior leaders from agencies uh, involved in decision making so that weather isn't just a conversation way down at this low level that we can actually have senior leaders and organizations uh, agencies involved so next slide we'll go to the next slide here can you get the next slide randy trying to <laughs> hey, there, we go. there we go. So like I said, the 2017 Weather Research and Forecast Innovation Act uh, came out by Congress and they, they were looking for a, a better way for, and there's 15 government agencies out there uh, that actually have weather, which is pretty surprising. Probably, I would say most of you probably didn't even know that. We all know, you know, FAA, we all know Air Force and Navy. We know the Weather Service. 
but uh, even places like the State Department, you know, have weather people. So um, I, I can just tell you when I worked, I used to work when I worked at NORAD NORFCOM doing Homeland Defense. Um, when a hurricane was hitting Cabo San Lucas, the State Department was involved with evacuating U.S. citizens. So they had to have weather people know what was going to happen. So how we can uh, evacuate people. So next slide. There we go. So how does it function? So the way it is set up, ICAMS, it falls under the Office of Science and Technology, which is at the White House. And um, the principals represent all ICAMS agencies and departments. Like I said, there's like 15 of them. Um, we were called OFCM. Well, we still are technically, we're in that transition. Congress has approved it, but it has not become official through NOAA channels yet. There's all kinds of paperwork, but we will become the Interagency Meteorological Coordination Office, IMCO. So that should happen here probably in the next month or two. Um, the inter, uh, IMCO is going to have an executive director, and that person is going to be detailed to OSTP at the White House. And then the IMCO deputy director and staff will be in Silver Spring at Building uh, 2. And the deputy director currently is filled by Martine Yapour as a interim uh, volunteer for the year. And I believe he's going to be ending his position in December or January. And they're going to be bidding out that job as a uh, ZA5, ZP5 rather, um, and become the permanent position. So that person's going to kind of run MCO and the as the administrative person. Uh, but we'll be involved with ICAMS as well. So next slide. So here's kind of the structure. As you can see, the ICAMS at the top. And as you go down and to the right, we have the IMCO, which is where I'll be working. And then under that, we have four working committees. And it was bantered back and forth when ICAMS started. How many should we have? You know, they wanted six at first, but we came up with four committees. And those committees are observations and then cyber facilities and infrastructure. That's really just comms. A committee on services, which is a, probably the biggest one, as you'll see. And then committee on research and innovation, um, which has kind of been around. ESPC uh, has been around for a long time doing the research. So the whole thing with ICAMS, we want to have research to operations, but also operations to research with back and forth uh, coordination. And that's why you see the blue arrows going back and forth between those four committees, because there's going to be a lot of overlay between some of these. Uh, they'll have common ground. So it, it's not going to be a stove pipe. Um, if it falls on the robs, they don't talk to anybody else. It's That's not the way this is supposed to be. So next slide. So under these committees, so under uh, COBS, observations is called COBS, C-O-B-S, that's the acronym for it. We have space-based observations, and then we are going to have two other groups. Uh, one is going to be surface and subsurface, which is any platform that's on the ground, on the water, or below the ground, or below the water, and then air which is anything from an inch above the surface to the outer atmosphere, and then obviously space bases out in space. And then under sci-fi, is which is the comms one, there's the cloud computing uh, for Earth systems, um, the ESD, the Earth System Data, and Operational Processing Center. So they do all the comms stuff. Committee on Services, this is a big group, but has all your weather services, your climate, uh, hydro, atmosphere, fire, aviation, marine, all this stuff is going to fall under this committee. So it's a, it, I think they have 18 uh, working groups under this uh, committee. And then Committee on Research and Innovation. So like I had said before, the uh, Earth System Modeling and Prediction, 
data assimilation, uh, weather and climate prediction, and earth systems. So that's your research, that's the R part. Next slide. And this is going a little more detail. So under those, uh, like in, in the COBS, we have the space space OBS, air and ground, which is going to become uh, just air and in situ, which will be uh, surface and subsurface. We're transitioning those two subcommittees this week or next week. So that's why this slide, I left it as it is. But you can see there's different working groups that are going to fall under each one of these. So everything in blue are working groups that are going to be falling under these committees. So I'm not going to read all these because we got limited time today, but I believe these slides will be shared. So next slide. This is just kind of showing you the leadership. So they're trying to be very diversified in every which way you can think of the word diversification. Um, we want uh, representatives from everything. We don't want one agency. I mean, we all know NOAA Weather Service is the powerhouse when it comes to weather, pretty much has the most people in the government doing that uh, kind of work. But as you can see, looking at these agencies, we've got all the different agencies, you know, NASA, USGS, NOAA, NIST, DOE, Department of Agriculture, um, DOD, uh, DOE. So lots of different agencies are chairing or co-chairing these four committees. And these are all volunteers. These are not paid uh, positions. They're paid, but they're people that work for other these agencies and they volunteered our times to be co-chairs. So it's double duty and all of us working uh, tend to have a lot of things get done after five o'clock because they have regular jobs as well. Next slide. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide, go to the next slide. There's nothing that much on here. So like I was saying earlier, there's 15 agencies out there and I'm not gonna read all these, but uh, there might be a few on here, like I said, that might be surprising that actually have weather on there, um, just like Nuclear Regulatory Commission. These are not typical government agencies you hear about when you think about weather. So we're trying really hard to get all these agencies in there and um, look for anywhere there's interagency cooperation needed and um, expand their horizons beyond just the DOD, DOT, and, and uh, NOAA Weather Service. Next slide. So we, did, we have some milestones, and I'll just briefly go over these. I'm not going to read all these slides, um, but you can see there's four milestones. I'll read that part, and then we'll go on. Um, milestone one was transition the federal um, coordinating structure into ICAMS, which we've done. Um, establish a interagency MCO office and executive leadership. We're probably 90% done there. MCO is established and the executive director has been selected but not announced yet. So the executive director also is, I'm not saying it's a political position, but it is a person that's supposed to be SES, could be a 15, will come from another agency, work for a year at the White House, and then after a year will go back to their position and another person will take their place. Unlike the deputy director, which will be a permanent position. Milestone three, communicate ICAM's goals. And four, engage with the community and career scientists to inform a long-term plan. So right now we also have the ICAM's transition team. Uh, which we have one or two people in there right now. And they're kind of uh, working as the leadership, and they have been uh, until the executive director is announced. So let's go to the next slide. So here's just kind of, I'm not going to read all this again. This is the ICAMS milestone one, and you can see on here what we've done. Like I said, ICAMS was started. We set up committees, we set up rosters, working groups. So all the rosters are set 
And, but they are, you know, it's not nothing set in stone. It can be changed. Uh, but all the members and co-chairs of all the working groups, subcommittees, committees, is diversified between all those 15 government agencies. We're trying to, like you said, really get a true interagency coordination going on with every agency represent, represented, represented. So next slide. Like I said, um, it was approved by Congress in September for IMCO. Um, hopefully we'll be officially be dropping OFCM and becoming IMCO here probably within a month or so. It's just a, a paperwork at this point. Um, and I've told you this. So Mike Bonadonna, the current uh, director of uh, OFCM, he will actually be moving on and he there he's moving over to Nesdis as they replace the director job with the deputy director and executive director of IMCO. So next slide. So communicate ICAM's goals and structures. Um, that's on its way. You can see there's the portal, ICAM's portal. So if you have more questions after this, um, there's, there's a question. I think there's an FAQ page on there. So we'll go to the next page. Um, milestone form, engage the community with the early career scientists. That's the other thing. Um, we're trying to get more youngsters out there. Um, like I kind of mentioned earlier, me and Randy have known each other for almost 30 years. Um, we need more young, young blood out there. And um, it's important to have us old guys, but uh, we need the youngsters in there as well. And that's one of the issues the with government hires taking six to nine months, you know, a kid graduates, they don't want to wait six to nine months to work where they can get a job in the private sector, as most of you know, uh, maybe next month. So that's that's a government problem that they're looking at. Next slide. So the way forward, um, like I said, we started ICAMS. It's a work in progress. Um, we're doing work plans right now. And we're just trying to figure out what's the, the long-term uh, goal for ICAMS. And not only have, we used to have at OFCM, it was mostly bottom up, but we also want to have top down uh, from the administration, which as many of you probably already know under the Biden-Harris is uh, fire weather, climate change, and then since it, it kind of came up with the flooding in Tennessee that killed all those people, you know, um, doing a better job of communicating weather to those poor areas that maybe don't have the communication tools that a, a more established community would have. Next slide. Uh, next steps. Uh, I pretty much talked about all this already. Next slide. So here's some links um, and uh, and email addresses for ICAM's contact. Um, like I said, these slides I think will be shared so you can get all that. Next slide. And that is it. I think I did pretty good, right at high noon. So we have 10 minutes uh, for questions. And I'll do my best. Are you seeing any questions there in the chat box at all? It is. Uh, how much influence? This is from Matthias. Um, how much influence will ICAMS have on the decision and policy making? Well, that's what it's supposed to be. So, and that's what we're working on. So that's coming down. You know, that's where OFCM maybe had lack compared to ICAMS in theory. ICAMS is supposed to have those senior leaders um, not that are non-weather people that actually have an effect on budgets and decisions for their agencies. Um, so ICAMS is supposed to try to get those people involved and have communication where when we have a weather issue, 
that needs funding or it's going to affect policy for the government, those senior leaders are involved. So that that's one strength that ICAMS is supposed to establish. So since we're new, we haven't actually done it yet. So, but in theory, it should be a good thing. Does that make sense? That answer your question, Matthias? It does. It was sort of a, a look in a sense, how much has changed really? Did we just changed the name, but it's the same influence or lack thereof uh, on what's happening in, in the policy and decision making arena, or has something changed that will really lift this to, to a different level? And it may also depend on the administration as to how much influence or how much of an open ear there is to, to influence what's happening. So yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, it should, it should be, we have much more, we have many more agencies involved directly now. And we have many, so in those direct, and in, in supposed to have many more senior leaders involved as well. So that are non-weather people. And like I said, that have in charge of the budgets and policy making. So that's, that's what this was all about. So in theory, it should work. Any other questions? Uh, Matt uh, has one that uh, says whether it's from the bottom up or the top down, it seems that the OCF, uh, OFCM and ICAMS are really about cross coordination, which at the end of the day takes people. Are there enough people to get the job done, especially recognizing this is my comment that it is voluntary, so. Well, it's supposed to and everybody that volunteers understands the commitment that so anybody who's on a member or a chair had to be approved by a senior level person, uh, an SES person at those 15 government agencies. So it has the cooperation of all the senior leaders, non-weather senior leaders that had to approve everybody. And there's hundreds and hundreds we have on our rosters. I think over 500 that are different people on these member that are members of these committees, working groups, subcommittees. Um, so I think so. Any other questions? Still got five minutes or we can be ahead of schedule. Uh, we've got a couple that have uh, come in here. Uh, from uh, Joshua Malloy, ICAM should consider reaching out to NOAA uh, hauling, hauling scholarship program to raise awareness of ICAMs and their desire to recruit, involve the next generation of scientists. So more of a comment. Uh, Steve Dar uh, does have a question. How do ICAM committees monitor developments outside of the government? Um, well, hopefully if, and this is in theory, this is how the theory of it's all supposed to work. Having 15 government agencies, so a lot of these agencies do work with outside non, we have a group called non-government data, like in the OB, COPS, observations. So they're supposed to be reaching out to some of these outside sources uh, to see what they're doing as well. Um, but that's TBD. We'll see how that works. Um, but there is a process for it. So hopefully there will be outreach to these private sector as well. Okay, and uh, Joshua did uh, add an additional um, tack on to his comment earlier. Also, there's a National Weather Service New Hire course uh, that, that could be uh, reached out to. Uh, Steve, did that uh, satisfy your question there? Yes. <laughs> yes, thanks. I'm not sure if they think that it did or was that a thanks, but anyway, <laughs> no, uh, that looks like that took care of that. So, uh, any others for Dave here? Uh, and, and, oh, sorry. Yeah, Matthias has uh, chimed in. Is there a process on how to suggest topics to ICAMS 
that should get uh, looked at? Um, well, you can always send an email to any of us at IMCO, former OFCM, and then we can pass it on to those committees and say, hey, you know, we have, um, especially the research, I'm not, I'm part of the COBS committee, so I'm very smart on that. I was in the services one before. The research one, um, Sim James has been, is, is our representative. And so if you have something that's a research topic or something, you know, you can always reach out to him or me and um, I can forward to them and see what they want to do with it. You know, that's something that's important, obviously. But that's an excellent question. That's why Matthias is the co-chair. He's asked excellent questions. So I see here, how can early career scientists get involved? Um, usually if they know about ICAMS, they can talk to their supervisor and say, hey, you know, how do I get involved and how do I become a member of one of these working groups or such? And um, because there's probably somebody already there, but trust me, most of those positions and members in that are only going to do it for a year or two because it is a volunteer. So um we would love to have new people um volunteer because you know when something first starts up there's always kind of volunteers but as things progress over years sometimes uh it's harder to get those volunteers and there's uh two other questions uh the second one first since it's kind of tied to what we we're just talking about matt uh asked if should icams um imco have a presence at the AMS uh, annual meeting this January to attract young scientists? Awesome question. Yes, they already are. <laughs> there you go. Um, we, are, we are presenting it in January. And uh, Randy Bask asks, if someone's just learning about ICAMS and really wants to be on one of the committees, is it too late? Um, if not, how do they go about requesting to be on a committee? Um, well, first of all, I would if someone in your agency, so FAA in Randy's case, um, you tell me what you'd like to do. I can always reach out and and see if they're looking for new members still, or find out who's the like FAA rep on whatever committee there is right now. And when that when they leave, you could take their place. Um, they're very limited. They're they're trying to keep these members and committees very the list are very tight very controlled every position has to be approved by a senior ses and those agencies um so like randy can't just say hey i want to be on such and such committee and dave choney goes and puts them on the roster we can't we're not allowed to do that they're they're trying to keep these groups small tight and one representative from each agency and the reason they do that is say if you had a group that had 20 people and five of them were from FAA. Well, you know how that committee is going to slant then, right? It's going to slant towards the FAA. So they're trying to just have one rep from each each uh, agency. Um, so if you have something you're interested in, the best thing is, and I see here Bill Bauman says, I'm the FAA rep. So I know Bill and Randy know each other, so they can talk. But uh, But that's how it should work. Find out from your senior leader boss in your agency who's part of ICAMS and say, hey, next time they're looking for uh, volunteers, I want to do that. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Dave. We're, uh, we're, we've reached the, uh, the time limit. Um, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the information and the uh, answering the questions. And, and, in our, and in, as far as my question, it's actually more for some of the uh, smaller agencies that are you know, more non weather related than uh, than the others. Um, so I figured yeah. so. I, I know who my rep is. Yeah, I kind of figured he, you did. He's so. my boss. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank thank you for that. And if uh, anybody else has any questions, you know, feel free to ask them in the chat and we can uh, uh, provide them to, to Dave and he can get back to you uh, probably on a on a one on one basis. Um, but uh, again, thank you very much. And I gave you my email, so if someone wants to email me, that's fine. All right. OK, let's uh, let's move on and we're going to start our uh, first uh, session of the day. And. I think we're
think what I'll do. Um, huh, let me have that. What I will start with is the. Uh, uh, I will introduce the first uh, pre presenter and have them uh, talk and then we'll go through and, and basically the plan is each uh, panelist will get about five to seven minutes or so to uh, to talk about their organization or themselves or what they do and in, in as far as uh, supporting the or uh, supporting uh, aviation weather. Uh, some of them have slides and I'll bring those up as they do others don't um, but I'll uh, start with a, a quick bio on each person. Um, so I think what I'll do is uh, I will start out with Uh, let's start with uh, Joshua, Mal Joshua Malloy from uh, aviation, uh, the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit. And uh, Joshua is the uh, Warning Coordination Meteorology uh, Meteorologist of the uh, Dual Office. Is actually the A Alaska Aviation Weather Unit and the Alaska, uh, the Anchorage Volcanic Advisory Center. Uh, in that role, he serves as a liaison between the Office and Interested Parties of Aviation Meteorology for their uh, area of responsibility, which is pretty huge. Uh, he's worked there since 2014 and has been part of the Weather Service uh, since 2008. Um, he did have uh, several years uh, stint in the uh, private sector meteorologist, uh, meteorology, formerly at uh, WSI and uh, four years of uh, active duty uh, U.S. Air Force uh, service uh, serving in uh, Air Mobility Command. So just a minute, Josh, and let me uh, uh, bring up your uh, your slides and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, do you see it? I do, I do. Thank you, Randy. And uh, good day to everybody who's out there on the call. Um, as mentioned, Josh Malloy here representing the Alaska region of the National Weather Service, the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit, also known as the AWU, uh, and the Anchorage Volcanic Ash Advisory Center, also known as the Anchorage VAC. Uh, warning Coordination Meteorologist of the office, as mentioned, basically a liaison, uh, an interface between my office and interested parties of aviation meteorology, uh, reaching out and engaging uh, with users and customers of our products trying to ascertain whether or not what we're providing is actually useful, uh, what's not so useful. Uh, if it is useful, how it's actually being leveraged in decision-making for operations. Uh, how are uh, those uh, customer operations evolving and making sure that we're staying abreast of that in our office and keeping our operations fresh and relevant as well. Um, as mentioned, we're a dual office. So uh, the staff who are engaged in uh, meteorological watch office responsibilities are also monitoring the volcanoes. So two very important uh, services are being provided by our office. Uh, and just a tidbit, we're also co-located with uh, a few other weather service entities. We're all in the same complex, uh, pretty close to the Ted Stevens International Airport. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the uh, overview of services area of responsibility, basically the area that you see on the map there uh, that's uh, bounded by the yellow lines. Uh, that is essentially the uh, the Anchorage uh, Flight Information Region, or, or FERS. It's about 2.4 million square miles of airspace. Uh, so our staff are uh, providing SIGMETs and AIRMETs, area forecasts, um, an array of aviation graphics. Uh, the traditional hazards are listed there, the icing, the turbulence, thunderstorms, um, outlook charts, surface maps, et cetera. Uh, providing phone briefings to the general aviation community. Uh, I think we have a very good rapport with the uh, with the bush pilot community uh, up here. Um, Pre-pandemic, it would not be unusual for some of them to actually stop by the office, engage with us, uh, ask us questions directly about you know uh, maybe flights that they have planned in the in the near future. Um, we also provide uh, briefings uh, for government agencies uh, for exercises, specific exercises and missions. Um, in more recent years, there's more, been more of a focus up on the high Arctic, on the, in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, we have entities that are up there that are uh, assessing the ice pack, uh, checking out on uh, wildlife, doing wildlife surveys, things of that nature. So we do provide some support also for those types of uh, endeavors. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, continuing on for the uh, volcanic ash uh, operation piece, uh, on the map there, at least the, the one on the top, uh, what you see there basically is the, the northern rim of the Pacific Ocean's uh, ring of fire. So those uh, orange slash uh, uh, red triangles that you see, those are the volcanoes. Um, there are over 50 active volcanoes in the Alaska region. Uh, but we're also mindful of volcanoes uh, over the Kamchatka Peninsula and the Kuril Islands area, prevailing winds being generally out of the west. Uh, a subset of those volcanic ash eruptions, provided there's enough volcanic ash, uh, will move you know, eastward right into our area of responsibility. And you can see that the jet routes uh, pretty much go right through that area. Um, obviously, there's going to be domestic and international coordination. Um, uh, the map below, you'll see that is a, actually a map of the area responsibility for the nine volcanic ash advisory centers across the world. There's nine of them. Uh, two of them fall under the auspices of NOAA. Uh, Washington, D.C. VAC, uh, uh, which actually falls under NESDIS, uh, is one of them. And the, then the other one's up here in Anchorage. Uh, our area of responsibility is actually that bolded area uh, on the map in the top left hand part of that map. Um, so uh, we share a, an international border. Uh, with Tokyo VAC uh, to the west, uh, we share a border uh, along the uh, the eastern portion of our AOR with the Canadians at Montreal VAC would be the other international one that we coordinate with. Uh, and, and then to our south, uh, we share a border with, uh, with Washington VAC. So all the coordination efforts, uh, handovers of responsibility, uh, the graphics, uh, uh, the advisories that we put out, that all kind of fulfills the International Airways Volcano Watch uh, Charter. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, forecast challenges in Alaska, if I had to just put one on you guys, uh, it's observation sparseness. Um, uh, sparseness with regards to METARs, sparseness with regards to balloon sounding ray op sites, uh, sparseness with regards to radars. Um, highlighted there, uh, that uh, little uh, image on the bottom left uh, kind of shows the radar network of the lower 48. I have Alaska kind of superimposed on there. Uh, so those blue uh, circles, those are the radars that they're privy to in the lower 48. Uh, the open red circles you see, that's what, we're, that's what we have available in Alaska. Seven radars for the entire state. So obviously large subsections of the state uh, and the adjacent marine areas are not sampled by radar and other uh, observation networks. Uh, another challenge we have is the pilot report density. Uh, this is uh, pretty much comes to the forefront when we issue SIGMETs or AIRMETs or just in general, we're, we're highlighting an area that we believe will be impactful for aviation meteorology. Well, we know that a subset, maybe a small a portion of the customers will see that information and decide not to fly that day. Uh, and then the rest will say, well, we're gonna fly, but we're just not necessarily gonna fly through that area, maybe just above it, below it, or around it. And as such, we don't necessarily get the verification uh, to kind of corroborate whether or not those significant conditions actually occur. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 and certainly a, a challenge that we run into up here in Alaska. Next slide, please. Uh, as far as areas of research needed, I know there's going to be more discussion about this later. Don't necessarily have to cover all these. Uh, I would say there's probably two on there that are probably more unique to Alaska. Uh, the first, uh, the third, and the fifth bullets up there. So better guidance to kind of project volcanic ash density and its eventual dispersion. You see the little image on the bottom. That was a, a major eruption at Redoubt Volcano. Um, and that was a higher visibility, high impact event because it's a Cook Inlet volcano. We actually had some trace at ashfall. Uh, in the city of Anchorage with that particular event. Uh, but not all events are you know, necessarily that impactful, that large. Uh, obviously with time, with the passage of time and uh, distance from the volcano, typically the ash is gonna start to dissipate. Uh, but that threshold of where it is still a, an aviation hazard posing a true hazard to, to aviation uh, operations, and when does it become more of a nuisance, you know, SO2 clouds, steam and smoke. Uh, I think we need more research on that. We certainly would benefit from better guidance on uh, dispersion of, of volcanic ash. Um, same thing, uh, that last bullet there about the probabilities of blowing dust and resuspended volcanic ash, relic ash uh, uh, that, blow, that blows around, gets picked up, transported by strong winds, um, and then blowing dust. You know, how, how low will that visibility get? How broad a scope will that blowing dust be? How high will that blown, the top of that blowing dust layer be? We, again, we could use better guidance for that stuff. Uh, and then the one in the middle there about the cold air aloft, um, you know, consistently the FAA uh, lets our local CWSU know, and also us in, in the AWU when the CWSU is not in the shop, 
uh, that they want to know where those temperatures, minus 65 degrees Celsius or colder are. Um, uh, you know, it, it's possible some of those aircraft that are going through those extreme temperatures, at least for an appreciable period of time, uh, may uh, suffer some, you know, performance problems. So they want to know where those areas are. And again, we don't really have really good guidance for that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, that pretty much concludes all I have. I have some contact information below. Look forward to the discussion and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Josh. And uh, now we're going to move to another Josh. We're going to uh, go to uh, Joshua Shrek from uh, uh, Aviation Weather Center. And Josh, I uh, I know you don't have any slides, so I'll uh, let you go ahead and get started. All right, thanks a lot, Randy. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, folks, you get the uh, Joshua tag team from NOAA's National Weather Service today. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm I'm Joshua Sheck, the uh, uh, the aviation support branch chief at the uh, Aviation Weather Center in Kansas City and in Warrington. Um, so we have a, uh, a, a very similar mission to the AWU, the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit that you just heard about um, with a, a, a few key differences. Um, so just overall, Aviation Weather Center, very similar products. We issue SIGMETs, we issue air, uh, G AIRMETs, uh, still have a, a, some, uh, some area forecast text products mixed in. Um, we also do uh, a lot more convective um, work. Whereas we do less with the volcanic ash, we do, um, we issue products, we monitor and uh, and deal with those issues, but but we have a separate portion of volcanic ash uh, advisories, a group that's contained within NESDIS, uh, which is a, another line office within NOAA, who issues those for uh, for the area of responsibility closer to CONUS. Um, we have a, a few branches. Um, so we'll we'll start with uh, the operational tip of the spear, our, our national aviation meteorologists that are embedded within the FAA command center. Um, their their main focus is uh, is traffic flow planning and advising um, of weather conditions to the FAA, the the ATC SCC, um, the FAA command center traffic flow planners and. Uh, um, folks who are focused on the efficiency of flight in the national airspace system. Um, we have a, uh, a, a domestic operations branch, um, which consists of a number of desks that focus on, uh, on uh, graphical air mats and SIGMET issuance, as well as uh, um, the uh, the aforementioned convective, the traffic flow management convective forecast or TCF, and uh, and then we have an international operations branch, which uh, is is highly focused on um, on world area forecast center duties as well as uh, some tropical duties found offshore down in Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, and and across parts of uh, of um, of the the Eastern Pacific, um, so we are one of three Met watches. The AWU handles Alaska, and the Honolulu Forecast Office handles uh, um, Oceanic out in that direction, and and their area. the The fourth branch um, is the Aviation Support Branch. So I'm I'm the chief of that branch, and what a lot of folks I think forget when we talk operations in the National Weather Service that that has lots of implications. We typically think of the the human over the loop forecaster 
uh, or warning operator who is producing the products that then get dissem disseminated. But we also have a number of, of automated products um, within aviation support branch, we support all aspects of that, all the data flow, all of the, uh, the dissemination processes. We, we look at, um, at ways to pick up efficiencies within the NOAA IT infrastructure. We have three main groups. Um, the, the, uh, the web team, um, and I'll, I'll plug Austin Cross is going to speak tomorrow um, and present the future vision for uh, for really modernizing our web services. But aviationweather.gov is hosted out of out of our branch, um, or at least the design and and the code and and uh, support uh, using NOAA infrastructure. Um, and that website uh, receives up to 80 million hits a day, so it's it's about as busy as Ford.com or Time.com or NewYorkTimes.com. Um, so it's not a small site, um, and I'm, I'm sure all of you folks are familiar with that. If not, AviationWeather.gov. Um, and it's a great time to start looking at it because it, it is uh, about to evolve considerably to a much more mobile friendly uh, uh, interface. And then another team is the IT infrastructure that supports all of the operations. So all of the uh, virtual machine infrastructure, all of the networking that connects forecasters to data, that, that channels PI reps, um, that, uh, that gets the, the products disseminated, and then finally, we have a, a, a science group, um, a science team within the aviation support branch. And that group, um, all of the, all three of those groups are made up of both uh, feds and uh, CIRA associates. That's uh, Colorado State University uh, Institute for Research in the Atmosphere. It's a partnership uh, cooperative. Um, that group on the science side is is where the magic happens in terms of uh, of research to operations. That's where the aviation weather test bed um, uh, finds its its uh, its use as we as we look to evolve operations and move things forward. So some things that are working well. Um, we we have a a, a pretty good. Um, a pretty good idea of mutually beneficial ways to evolve our our services between the FAA and and uh, and the Aviation Weather Center, um, and and pretty good partnership with with NTSB. I, I think those partnerships are strong. Of course, we all have our uh, our disagreements, but I think when you lay the Venn diagram out, there's a lot of overlap uh, between all three agencies. And I think uh, that's allowing us to move our, our operations forward. Um, I think some things that, that need some improvement, there are so many entities within uh, FAA and, and the sheer size of FAA compared to NTSB and, and uh, NOAA or the National Weather Service. I think, uh, I think I'm not sure that we we have a, a bit of an inequity between number of people that need to be in in the loop and and collaborated with, and I, I'm not sure that that balance um, is helping us. I, I feel like there are so many people that have to be involved on the FAA side compared to the much smaller group on the NOAA side. So that's a personal opinion and and just an area where where we we really. Are, are doing our best to focus and, and try to close those gaps. Um, and, and then secondly, I, I think the, uh, the data flow back and forth between FAA and NOAA, wh while we've had some tremendous successes and I, I'm, I think there's cause for, for great uh, hope, I'm seeing very inspirational conversations between FAA and NOAA on, on the observation network and the acquisition of, of EDR and, and uh, the increasing uh, PIREPS uh, emphasis. Um, I also think that 
you know, we've had some struggles moving data from NOAA into uh, CSS weather as it, it, it gets stood up. And we, we also have some struggles going backwards from FAA back to NOAA. And, and those have operational impacts that I, I think are worth uh, noting. Um, with that, I, I think I checked my time, Randy, and I, I'm okay, but um, uh, I think I can hand it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Josh. Uh, next, we're going to uh, uh, hear from Kurt Squires at the uh, New York uh, CWSU. Um, Kurt's actually back home. He was uh, uh, born on Long Island in Mastic, Mastic New York. Um, then decided that uh, he, he liked islands, so he went to the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I uh, got both his uh, bachelor's and master's degree from there and then went back to uh, to Long Island and has been at the uh, uh, CWSU since then. So, uh, Kurt, I know you're busy with uh, the weather going on there, so I'll uh, go ahead and hand it over to you and I will uh, uh, get your slides here set up. All right, over to you. All right, Kurt, are you still there? He says he's having trouble getting his mic to unmute. Um, and, and Randy, while I got you, I assume that you'd like the whole questions. Uh, let me group them together until after all of the uh, panelists have had their intro speaking. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, let's yeah, let's do okay. that. All right, uh, let me see if I can. Uh, Kurt, you still trying to speak there? Let me see if I can unmute them. The mysteries of teams. Dave, I looked. It's uh, it's grayed out right now. Uh, so um, um, yeah. You know, you know what? Why don't see if uh, maybe he can log out and log back in. And in the meantime, we'll go ahead and. Um, We'll go to Corey Gempler in the meantime and uh, let uh, let Corey go ahead and talk. So, yeah, and, um, and, and Kurt, just leave the meeting and come on back in. Sometimes that seems to cure whatever ails the audio. So, so uh, in the meantime, we'll uh, like I said, we'll go ahead to uh, uh, Corey Gempler. He's the manager of the weather services for uh, uh, Federal Express. And yes, he's not in the federal government, but I thought it would be good to have a uh, kind of that end of the spear. Who's receiving the information from the uh, from the government to uh, to talk about it? So, uh, Corey, go ahead. Thanks, Randy, and uh, thanks for everyone for organizing this. Uh, Matthias and uh, and uh, Mr. Franzak uh, through. Uh, Glad to be here today. So we're going to talk about, I don't have any slides, we're going to talk about the uh, A4A today and from an airline perspective, industry perspective, um, just some background on the A4A. Uh, it's a basically a, a work group um, that, um, I'll just read it here, it's a work group that advocates on behalf of its members to shape global policies and measures that promote safety, security, and a healthy U.S. airline industry. So the airlines for America works with uh, the labor issues, Congress and other administrative industries, uh, agencies to uh, to get the, the best out of the, the the NAS and what's good for the airline. So I am this year's um, chairman of the A4A Meteorology Committee. So the Meteorology Committee, uh, there are certain committees in the A4A and they all re um, report up to the uh, Operations Council uh, which again uh, is involved with talking to uh, agencies like the FAA, the NTSB, uh, National Weather Service, uh, ATC side of things. And our managing director is Bill McDonald, who act ironically used to be uh, chief pilot here at FedEx. So he has helped us tremendously, uh, the A4A meteorology group. Sometimes it's called the MET Working Group as well, so the MWG. 
But we have uh, 10 members uh, in the A4A and one associate mem member, which is Air Canada. So those, those um, members for the, on the A4A are Alaska, American, Atlas, Delta, FedEx, Hawaiian, JetBlue, Southwest, United, and UPS. And then, as I mentioned, the associate member, um, Air Canada. So we as a group, uh, get together and we, we um, talk about issues internally and then we also uh, collaborate and get briefings from mostly the, the FAA and the National Weather Service. Obviously, they impact us the most. Um, the, the committee chairman rolls over every year to the vice chairman. So this is actually my second go around as the chairman. I did it about, uh, I think, six years ago. Uh, Randy Baker from UPS is uh, the vice chair right now, so he will roll up to the chairman of the group uh, 2022, and uh, we will um, elect or appoint a vice chair at that time uh, to serve under Randy that will take over as the chairman in 23. So that's a little bit about our group. Uh, some of the hot topics that we work on, obviously there's been a lot of talk about um, with the FAA about mixed phase precipitation and implementing freezing fog and de-icing um, procedures. Uh, that's been the hot topic this summer. Uh, so we have a pretty good relationship with uh, the FAA. Uh, Chuck Enders, uh, Jordy Rother, Rother coming on and talking to us about these issues. Um, we also do uh, meet twice a year face to face. Now we've had to do that virtually for the last uh, 12, 18 months. And we usually meet in the spring and in the fall or late spring, early winter. We met in June virtually. We had a very good meeting, an all day meeting uh, with guest speakers from the FAA and the National Weather Service. And so our next one is coming up here at the end of November, where we'll, we'll again our, our twice a year face to face meeting virtually with um, guest speakers. Um, one of the hot topics that um, has come up is the outages for the Weather Service. So we had um, Michelle Minnelli, uh, who's the uh, director of the Office of Dissemination at the Weather Service, talk to us uh, last June about the issues that they're having just to get some clarity on the struggles and the challenges that they're up against. And she outlined, you know, the legacy systems and the server issues that they were dealing with and how they were going to address them. So uh, that was very informative. Uh, obviously, Randy, you've been on there uh, as, part of, as part of AWRP, um, you know, Surface Weather, Steve Kim, uh, Kevin Johnston. Uh, you know, we, we know most of these uh, names, Bill Bauman's group, obviously, uh, Bruce Entwistle from the Weather Service, NOAA, is on. So um, I think we're doing pretty good is about, you know, what we're doing well. Uh, I think we're communicating better. I think these face-to-face -face meetings with airlines, um, with the agencies, is, is bringing out uh, a lot more content and information and, and information sharing. So I think that's good. Uh, we've also been involved with uh, Bill Murtaugh. Uh, program coordinator at Space Weather Prediction Center on, on doing some tabletops and uh, kind of Space Weather 101 for the airline and especially the dispatchers of airlines to get on and uh, listen to them. And because Space Weather, even though it has weather in the name, <laughs> isn't really weather. And even a lot of meteorologists are still trying to wrap their uh, head around Space Weather and as we come out of this um, sunspot lull, this minimum, as we ramp up the next five years, uh, obviously space weather is going to be an issue and it can obviously uh, throw a wrench into airline operations. So I think we're doing pretty good with that. Um, I guess maybe one thing maybe we're not doing so well, and I, but I think it's part of the COVID thing is everything is kind of siloed right now and we're maybe uh, just kind of coming out uh, kind of out of our COVID caves, and uh, that's why this group is so good to uh, to tune into and find out what the latest is going on. But I think we'll get there as we uh, kind of reconnect, uh, become less siloed, and um, I don't appreciate everything you, you, your group does. So, um, so that's a little bit about the A4A and uh, what we're doing and uh, some things we're doing well and some things we could do better, but like I said, a lot of that I think is tied to um, uh, where we've been the last 18 months.
I'll pass it back to you, Randy. OK, thank you, Corey. Um, is, did, did Kurt make it back on? Randy, I just scrolled through the uh, attendee list, and unless Kurt is on as a phone number only, the answer is no. OK. I just uh, see uh, something in the chat where it says he has temporarily joined. So I think he may have just, while you were talking there, maybe rejoined. Can we hear you, Kurt? I'm on via phone, he says. Okay. Um, which what which one is he and so we can maybe unmute him so there's one phone that is currently unmuted with an area 618 area code if that's you Kurt give us a sound check All right. Yeah, the, he says the 618. Ah, 618 is uh, Shane Cox, Captain who is our Cox. next speaker. Try. OK, well, we'll try. Uh, we'll try again to uh, get him uh, corrected. Um, Shane, can you uh, can you talk and can we hear you? Yes, sir, this is uh, Shane. You got me. Yes. All right. Great. We'll uh, we'll we'll go to Shane next then, and then uh, uh, come back to uh, Kurt hopefully at the end. So um, now we're going to get the, uh, the kind of the DoD perspective on uh, on current operations. So Captain Shane Cox is the flight commander of the fifteenth uh, uh, Operational Weather Squadron at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois. Uh, he leads uh, about thirty five personnel, um, providing. Uh, environmental intelligence for the Air Force, the Army, um, the Guard and the Reserve Forces uh, operating at 153 different installations across the uh, 25 state region. Um, he's a uh, 2013 graduate of the uh, uh, Air Force Academy and uh, has a uh, Bachelor of Science degree in meteorology and he's uh, even deployed a couple of times to uh, um, uh, overseas. Um, and including uh, going over to Korea. So uh, let me uh, get your slides up here and we'll go ahead and get started. Awesome, I appreciate the intro and uh, good afternoon, good morning and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to be on board this morning. So thank you for hosting me. Um, I do have some slides I'll kind of run through briefly. I know we're starting to run short on time, so I'll hopefully get through this quickly, but uh, try and give you the DOD's perspective on where we stand as far as our mission uh, here at the 15th Operational Weather Squadron. So uh, starting there, you see the task org chart. Uh, I know there's a few weather folks who have, were prior Air Force weather, and so I wanted to show this just to kind of describe that we're no longer organized under Air Force Weather Agency. We now are aligned under 16th Air Force, which is under um, ACC, Air Combat Command. And we also have the 557th Weather Wing. So we're trying to be more aligned with the rest of the Air Force in terms of uh, falling under a wing. Um, so with that comes, you know, if, if there's any sort of request for weather support, that needs to go through the institutional process rather than just saying, hey, Air Force Weather Agency, can you pick up my support? Uh, we can't just say yes to everything. It needs to be vetted and approved. So uh, you see the 15th Operational Weather Squadron there under Scott at uh, Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, and we're under the first weather groups, and so our, our chain of command falls uh, like that. So next slide, please. This is our command philosophy. The bottom line here is uh, we're trying to empower our airmen uh, to know that we have, you know, not only is the weather forecast important, but how can we tie that to operations? Is that going to allow an aircraft to land or drop a certain munition on a target? So uh, not just becoming proficient at the job itself, but also knowing how that ties back into operations. And so by knowing that, um, our airmen now have the capability to provide decision space to our commanders uh, to plan and execute missions accordingly. So slide, please. 
to kind of give you an overview, kind of alluded to this earlier, but this is our area of responsibility. So it encompasses the northeastern portions of the CONUS, which has about 25 states. Uh, also includes eastern Canada and also the Arctic, so basically anything north of 60 degrees north latitude. Uh, in that is 153 sites that we support and approximately 320 joint and total force units. That includes Army, Air Force, Guard, and Reserve. Uh, in total, that encompasses about 11 million square miles. And all in all, we do support uh, around 490,000 personnel and assets and equipment valued at $226 billion. Slide, please. So how we're organized on the actual operations floor, we do have 151 authorized manpower billets. You can kind of see the breakdown there, so pretty heavy on the enlisted structure. Uh, we do execute 24-7 operations, and how we approach that is what we call TBO, threat-based operations. So basically that means, you know, if, if a certain area is getting hit with severe thunderstorms or, or tornadoes or what have you, we try to allocate personnel to interrogate that threat and get everyone notified who needs to be uh, as far as, you know, sites affected or operations impacted. Um, as far as the breakdown on the operations floor, we do have 12 personnel on the floor at any given time, so you can call us day, night, or afternoon, and uh, there will always be 12 personnel on the floor. One of those is the senior duty officer, which I'm actually working today, so <laughs> I don't have the video uh, capability, unfortunately. Uh, we do have shift supervisors as well, so they help manage and supervise the actual forecasters who put out the airfield forecast, uh, the TAFS, which is the terminal aerodrome forecast, and then... Um, we do have a civilian overwatch manager who helps produce what we call the threat tracker, which is a 24 to 96 hour outlook uh, across our area of responsibility that looks at anything like heavy rain, such as two inches in 12 hours, uh, severe thunderstorms, et cetera. Slide, please. So this is the mission execution function slide. This basically talks to some of the higher level uh, missions that we do support. So Operation Noble Eagle, which is the Eastern Area Defense Sector, that is our number one priority. And at any point, we could receive a call to uh, support that mission. And so a pilot will never be put on hold. He will, he or she will always have that weather support 24-7. Uh, We're also the backup to the 25th Operational Weather Squadron headquartered out of Davis Mountain Air Force Base for the Western Area Defense Sector. That is their primary mission. As far as our aviation weather support, we do have just over 1,400 flight weather briefings per month. I can kind of see the breakdown there, but basically split between Air Force and Army Aviation. And then another note uh, specific to our unit here at Scott, we do produce the global aviation hazard charts. So this includes things like upper level and low level icing, turbulence, and then also thunderstorms. You can kind of see there in that bottom right hand picture, that is a, a picture of uh, the upper level turbulence that we produce 24-7. Slide please. So I guess the meat and potatoes of the brief here, this is the interagency backup. So we are partnered with the Storm Prediction Center and Aviation Weather Center. Uh, we do have approximately 25 to 30 airmen on a backup team. So just in case SPC or AWC uh, goes down or if there's a planned outage, we do support them doing uh, two to three backup tests per year. Uh, ever since we started the support in May of 2009, we've produced approximately 10,000 outlooks. And this has been ongoing even uh, despite the COVID-19 crisis that is uh, still continuing through this day. Slide, please. I just want to show a quick uh, overview of what our systems flight does. So these are the uh, cats that do all the work behind the scenes. We have three civilians and three active duty airmen who ensure that our entire operation runs without any seams. So and I do want to highlight there about the middle of the slide, uh, we are the number one bandwidth user here on Scott, which is kind of crazy considering we have a, a DESA, Defense Information Systems Agency, um, building here headquartered at Scott. And so you would think that that mission would require more bandwidth considering they have a global mission. But turns out our uh, unit of approximately 150 personnel uh, produce <laughs> are the number one bandwidth user on uh, Scott. And so we also have the production system for Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System, the AWIPS, which is, ties back into the SPC and AWC mission. Slide, please. And then this is uh, one of the last slides here. We are also, uh, not only are we accomplishing the home station mission here, but we are also tasked to provide uh, base operations support teams, which is a boss team. And each boss team has approximately three airmen that we send downrange either to uh, 
the Central Command AOR, uh, you know, places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, et cetera. So there's this constant rotation of personnel as far as getting their training up to date, getting them th uh, familiarized with the theater that they will be supporting. And of course, with any mission down in that uh, the Middle East part of the world, there's limited data, not as many observations, and therefore uh, the model data that we do have out there is, is uh, kind of lacking. So we do have to rely on current observations and a satellite to help us forecast. But all in all, that ties back into the mission execution forecast, and uh, it's basically a continuous uh, thing. So we're always constantly sending people out the door. So uh, slide, please. So that is all I have. Hopefully that was a uh, quick down and dirty. Um, I'll be here if you have any questions. And uh, I definitely appreciate you having me. So I will pass it over to Randy. Thank you. All right, Shane, thank you very much. And uh, we'll try one last time with Kurt. Are you back on? I know he, uh, he emailed me saying he was trying another method. So let's see if that works. All right, to tell you what, um, we'll, we'll continue to try to get uh, Kurt on here for the next couple of minutes, and if he, uh, if he uh, just speaks up or, or if we see that he's on, we'll uh, try again. Um, otherwise, uh, David, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, start going through some of the questions that have come in. All right, well, to kick it off, we do have two questions, both for uh, Josh Malloy and uh, kind of uh, as I would expect from uh, the uh, audience here. Um, Andy McClure has got a question about um, in light of the sparse METAR radars and forecast verification, um, where in Alaska or in the North Pacific which would you like to see an increase in infrastructure and what kind of tools would be needed? Well, that's a good question. And I, you know, maybe in my presentation I was a little too. Uh, uh, I mean, you're not even sure what the word is, but, uh, you, you know, we do have a car soundings uh, that can kind of help supplement our RAOB network. You know, some of the aircraft that are coming into some of our terminals, we can kind of leverage some of that information with regards to the temperature and the relative humidity and whatnot. Uh, and then we are heavy users of the FAA webcam network. And there have been more and more that have been uh, put online in the last several years. Uh, so those types of investments, I think, we are, are paying immediate dividends. In terms of real infrastructure, I don't think, from my perspective, me, Josh Malloy talking here, um, just a commensurate level of a network that they're privy to in the lower 48. Just starting to fill in the gaps. Maybe put a few more radars, if you're asking me where to put them, put a couple more uh, off to the west and southwest of Fairbanks. Put a couple in the, over the southwestern mainland uh, near McGrath. Uh, put a couple more up on. The, let's put some on the Arctic coast. We know that the that the Arctic is getting uh, 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 more airplay uh, these days because of its importance and you know, with climate change and whatnot. Let, let's get a couple up there. Um, let's improve our buoy network. Uh, I know you know that's more of a marine operate uh, application, but at least we can see the wind. We can see what the pressure is doing. We can kind of use even buoy data. In, in conjunction with, say, some of the scatterometer uh, satellite passes to kind of, uh, you know, maybe get a better feel for whether something is actually initializing there uh, that we're seeing in maybe some of the higher resolution models. Uh, so, yeah, some, some basic infrastructure investments certainly continue to uh, push out more webcams uh, through some of the, the more remote parts of the state. Uh, I think that would go a long way. Uh, for, for helping us uh, here in Alaska region. And I believe there would actually be downstream um, support also uh, because, you know, the models get initialized up here in Alaska. You know, all those systems are moving southeast towards the lower 48. Um, that could possibly uh, have good application for them as well. All right. And um, we do have one other question for you, Josh, um, from uh, Karen uh, Shelton Murr. The uh, how much concern and an issue is suspended ash uh referring to volcanic ash 
And is there some way to determine concentration of the uh, resuspended ash? And what is the disruption airspace as a result of resuspended ash? Okay, yeah. So, so resuspended ash, for the most part, uh, we only deal with that with one volcano in particular. Now, there, there is a caveat to that, and I'll get to it. But for the most part, the one that gives us the most problem is the Katmai Novarupta volcanic complex. There was a huge uh, mega uh, volcanic eruption back in 1912 over the valley of the 10,000 smokes. And there is ash all over the place. Uh, and it's relic ash from that particular eruption over 100 years ago. And so in strong northwesterly uh, flow situations, uh, that volcanic ash will get picked up and transported well downstream, in some cases, you know, over a couple hundred miles uh, to the southeast of the volcano complex. In terms of the height of that ash, in a general sense, our rule of thumb is usually between four and 6,000 feet. Uh, we have seen occurrences, some anomalous occurrences up to about 11,000 feet. Um, and, and typically it is relatively narrow and it kind of pivots you know, from a, generally from a northwest to southeast uh, trajectory, sometimes it pivots a little bit more to the east. Um, in terms of how does it actually impact the, you know, the, the disruption of the airspace? So there's a couple of things. Even though it's not there very high in the, in the atmosphere, it is getting pretty close. In some of the cases, we actually do see some of that ash uh, move over Kodiak City, which is uh, a major city, if you will, uh, over Alaska. It's a, it's a hub for some of the, the smaller airlines to get folks to and from the island because a lot of Alaska is off of the road system. Uh, so there are cases or there are some times when that ash can kind of move over Kodiak City and that can potentially shut down the airport. Um, we also know, at least you know from some conversations, I don't know if there's anybody from the U.S. Coast Guard on the call, but I know I've fielded some calls and some of the staffers have fielded some calls from, from the Coast Guard. Uh, wanting to know whether or not that ash is going to get close to Kodiak City or where where else around Kodiak Island uh, can it be expected. Um, you know, unfortunately, year after year, there's a lot of uh, search and rescue uh, missions that have to occur out there over the Northwest Pacific. And, you know, the Coast Guard is being deployed out there. And so, you know, it, it can potentially impact those operations, too. Um, in terms of other volcanic ash resuspension events, and, and I know there was, an, there was a question there about or there was a follow-up to that original question about concentrations of the ash. Quite frankly, I don't think there's really any real way for us to determine, hey, this is a, a class A event or a class B event. I mean, the, what we do is we collaborate with the Alaska Volcano Observatory, which is part of the USGS Geological Survey. Um, they have some local modeling that they do out there based off of the strength of the winds. Uh, but in terms of you know how, how thick that concentration is, we just, tend to assume that it is very disruptive and it could potentially uh, pose a, you know, a significant hazard to any aircraft that are, you know, kind of going through that particular area. Uh, so right now, as I understand, there's no real way to kind of distinguish. We just kind of have a blanket uh, garden variety assumption uh, that it is uh, pretty disruptive and pretty significant to operations. Uh, to peel back off to other uh, uh, events, uh, just this year, for the first time that I've been in Alaska region, I've been up here in Alaska since uh, 2008, we actually had a resuspended ash event from Aniakchak, which is on the, uh, the Alaska Peninsula, or the southwestern por portion of Bristol Bay, uh, kind of between uh, King Salmon and Cold Bay. And we had some strong winds from the southeast, not anything more than typical garden variety, you know, 30 knots or so out of the southeast. And we actually had resuspended ash that was going into the Bering Sea. And, you know, even speaking with some of the people who've been here 20, 25 years, they could not recall a time when there was actually resuspended ash, confirmed resuspended ash by the, by the Pyreps and also by AVO of ash moving northwest opposed to southeast and from a different volcano. So I think there's still a lot that we don't know. Uh, and it's possible it could be occurring at, at other locations, but these are just the ones that, you know, that we know about right now. Hey David, can we uh, can we try Kurt one more time? I see that he's on, and see if his uh, his mic is working now. Can we hear him, Kurt?
Uh, doesn't, doesn't sound like we can get him. So uh, um, maybe 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 we can try again. Maybe Thursday morning if we can't get things working because we only got about eight more minutes. Um, so uh, um, and he did send it to me. It's a it's a very good uh, overview. But uh, um, let's go back to any questions. Okay. Uh, yes, and to everyone, yeah, we know that my mic has a lot of static. Uh, we're trying to hang on to the break before I drop off here. Um, the um, uh, Sharon or Karen did uh, respond back that she appreciated all those good comments, uh, Josh. Uh, that's the only ones that we had in the chat, um, Randy. So, are there any others, or did uh, Andy McClure? Did you want to respond to? Uh, Josh's explanation to your question uh, in any way. Well, thanks, David. Um, what Josh said matches up uh, pretty well with what I've been thinking. Um, just for your knowledge, Josh, I, I work for Alaska Flight Service. So um, we've been uh, working under the direction of the FAA administrator to come up with uh, FAA safety initiative um which covers basically anything that's going to improve aviation safety up here in alaska and i hope that uh there are people listening who will pay attention to the needs of alaska but uh thanks for your answer thanks andy and um for um uh for shane uh we have a question uh, from uh, Josh Sheck uh, at AWC. Concerning your global graphics products, are you able to use any of the AWC uh, World Area Forecast System uh, global hazard map to help your team's efficiency? Uh, yes, sir. Copy all. And I'm not tracking that we're able to ingest uh, anything from AWC. So right now we're using the, uh, the GALWIM, which is the the acronym is going to escape me, but the uh, Global Air Land Execution Model, something to that effect, but it's got a pretty decent resolution overall, and um, we use a software called Visual Weather to output and create all of our, our hazard charts for, you know, across the globe. So um, I'd have to ask the question as far as any, ingesting anything from AWC that might have uh, some implications as far as what we can accept on the, the DODI, you know, network. Um, so I'd, I'd have to see if that's a possibility with firewalls and, and things of that nature, but that's definitely something that could help us out. Uh, so I'd have to get back with you on that. Uh, over. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Shane. I, I think that might be one uh, even just small area where maybe we help each other a little bit. I, I know that the systems um, do cause issues when we when we coordinate with <laughs> with the Air Force. Um, but but we've also found ways around that. So even just as a as a, a reference point for your your folks uh, might be able to help each other out. Awesome. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll take a look at that and uh, get back with you. Appreciate it. Over. And Randy, I know we're down to five minutes. Uh, Matt did have one uh, question for all of the uh, panelists. Uh, for all of them, are there any common gap areas that uh, you each share? And Matt, if you need to elaborate on that, uh, go right ahead. No, I think it it was a uh, it was a fairly straight I hope fairly straightforward question and it's it's motivated in part by the fact that on Thursday you know we're going to be talking about gap areas and I was I was kind of hoping that you know in the brief here's who we are and what we do presentations you know maybe there would be a theme uh, something that that you know that more than one of the presenters talked to um, if there was, I missed it, and so I thought I'd I'd give an opportunity for for the the panelists to maybe you know think about what each one has said and what they said, and you know see if there's something that that jumps out to them.
Uh, hey, uh, Josh Malloy here. Um, yeah, I mean, I again, I can't really speak for the for the other entities there. Um, I, I think up in Alaska, because we do have some some unique challenges here. I'm, I'm not sure if they're all really applicable to to the lower 48. Um, I know I, I did touch on that uh, cold air aloft uh, concern that our local FAA uh, has up here, uh, and and for the the little bit of anecdotal uh, conversations we've had from from folks from the lower 48, it just doesn't seem like it's as, or even the Canadians, it just doesn't seem like, for example, cold air aloft, areas of cold air aloft at the flight levels that the uh, that the uh, jets are flying at, it doesn't seem to have as much of a sensitivity uh, in those other areas. It, or, or maybe it does it, but maybe it's just not being presented that way. But I, I know from our perspective, we have very limited guidance uh, when it comes to being able to actually identify and project that. I mean, in, in a general sense, you know, we can bring up some some guidance. Um, as mentioned, we have some rayouts up here that, where we can at least initialize what temperatures are, say at 30,000 feet, between 30 and 40,000 feet. Um, you know, the height of the tropopause maybe as a very loose uh, guide. Uh, but yeah, I mean, something like that, um, I, I tend to think that there is definitely a gap in there uh, in being able to kind of project that out in time. So I, I, from, from Alaska's perspective, I mean, that's one that kind of jumps out uh, for me. All right, we have uh, about uh, two minutes. I would, um, I think the only, I think the biggest gap I saw, and, and I'm not even sure it's really a gap, but, uh, you know, just the coordination among among those groups. Um, you know, there may not be any overlap in coverage except for maybe the the uh, the Air Force, but but certainly, you know, the, uh, you know, the AWU is needing to talk to AWC about uh, those common interests and, uh, you know, a4A flies everywhere, so there there is a common interest there. And it, you know, is, is is there communi is the communication between all those entities as good as it can be? And and uh, yeah, obviously, I think, uh, Josh was just talking to uh, Shane about that that potential uh, uh, you know collaboration among some of their products. So so that's where I see see it and. Uh, uh, Brian Pettigrew has one last question, and then we'll uh, um, to uh, Corey, and uh, then we'll uh, uh, take a break here. Um, as far as the public partner, uh, public-private partnerships have long been discussed. How do you see the future of this from uh, A4A side? Well, I think <clears throat> there already is a lot of uh, public-private interaction you know a lot of the airlines have their own private uh, weather entities within their operations centers <clears throat> so you know it depends on the future I think of the weather service and, and you know under the Trump administration obviously there was a lot of talk about privatization of the weather service and I'm now I'm sure that's hopefully off the uh, off the table uh, but you know I think there's a role there for the private sector. I don't. I don't see it changing too much. Maybe a gradual increase as as they maybe can. You know, sometimes their technologies might be a little bit uh, faster than the weather service. Just implementing those and getting them out to to others. But uh, you know, we we have uh, some relationship with the private sector, or some companies. Um, but you know, I think from at least a FedEx standpoint, we prefer the weather service to be the the leader. Uh, the primary source of, of uh, MedOp data, um, you know, TAPS and METARs. Uh, but, you know, there's there's probably a role there for the private, private sector, and, and it's probably continue to grow, but probably slowly. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Um, well, First of all, thanks for all the uh, thanks to all the panelists uh, for the uh, um, their participation and and the information they provided. Uh, there is one more question. I'll I'll go ahead and say uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and break and uh, uh, come back at 1:40 p.m. Eastern time, and uh, you can do the math for everybody who's not on Eastern time. 
Um, so if you uh, want to grab some lunch. Um, uh, for those who want to stay on for just a couple more minutes or no, another minute or so, Shane Cox did have a, uh, uh, a question for Josh Malloy. It says, uh, we're providing forecasts for various locations across the Arctic and have been conducting some model verification to see how good various models perform. Um, is there a go-to that you and your team utilize in terms of overall performance? Um, I don't know if we, you know, it's one of those deals where, I mean, I think there's been more of a focus now onto more like ensemble, the, the usage of ensemble modeling more than the individual models uh, themselves, the individual members. Um, I do know, you know, for, for the most part, when we're conducting our, our forecasts, you know, for the most part, it's in that, you know, like the area forecast, for example, it's over the next 12 hours. Uh, we do have some outlook charts that we produce that go out to 60 hours. Um, and because of internal limitations about how much stuff we can actually ingest into our workstations, oftentimes we're leaning more on the GFS than some of the other models per se in terms of where particular features may be, uh, especially the surface uh, features. Uh, certainly cold bias from the NAM model um, time and time again, especially during these uh, transition seasons. Um, I think in terms of, you know, when we have some of these systems that are kind of recurving up, uh, you know, extra tropical systems, I think maybe we put a little bit more uh, stock onto the EC model. Uh, but, you know, up over the high Arctic, you know, we, we try to leverage some of the uh, the ensemble guidance that it, that is privy to us uh, for, for our particular uh, purposes. We do make use of uh, the HER model and some of the more shorter term um, uh, areas uh, for potential for low fog and stratus, uh, both along the Arctic coast and, and offshore as we try to support some of those missions. Um, sometimes a little bit too much of a, of a false alarm rate uh, when, with that, but we try to leverage it where we can. Uh, so I, hopefully that gives you at least a little bit of insight from our perspective in Alaska. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, unless Matt Fronzik has anything, I say we uh, go ahead and break for uh, 26 minutes or so. Sounds good to me. Right. Sounds good to me, Randy, and I, I need to practice what I preach and so people can see my ugly face too. All right. Well, thanks everybody, and we'll uh, we'll see you in uh, about 25 minutes now. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, everyone.
Go ahead, Dave. Give me a try. Hello, hello. Is that any better? Tons, tons better. Okay, all I did was log off, log back on, but I hated to do that when I was in the middle of um, chatting. Yep, yep. No, I I know where you were. It was it was actually getting worse as time went on. So uh, yeah. so pe pe more people were responding. <laughs> I didn't change the networks or anything. So okay, very good. All right. Uh, cool. Okay, I saw that Brian was on too, so that's good. Yep. Sounded like you were on the HF from a long, long way away. <laughs> horrible, well, yeah. horrible, horrible, Dave. <laughs> pilot to communicate. It, it, welcome back. <laughs> it was like, well, what do I do now? For for yeah. several of us that uh, who, who have spent time in the in the cockpit of transoceanic aircraft, it was a it was deja vu all over again. You're talking on HF. <laughs> Again, you know, there just seems to be on Teams more than some of the other platforms, more um, things like that, you know, that we just all of a sudden, it's kind of like what Kurt was trying to get on board there, you know, and for some reason, uh, we could never hear his audio. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if it has anything to do with the, um, I, I saw somebody show up at the end as an unknown user participant with an mm -hmm. unknown email and everything, and they actually put something in the chat. And I was wondering if that was him, maybe trying to get out. But is there anything set up in this, Matt, the way that it was set up with, um, if somebody was not, quote, registered, if they were not able to, um, no. you know. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing magical. This is just the normal themes. Yeah, yeah. All, all that, all that registration. The, the only function or purpose it served was as a a gate for the the dial-in information. And even even that, as we have found out during the meeting, um, there was something goofy with with that too. I know on on, on our side, uh, neither Mike Robinson nor Bob Abgen, both of whom you know signed up for the meeting, got the notices. Um, and I, I believe they signed up in time too. I should qualify that uh, to, uh, because there was a cutoff day in time. But um, um, in any event, I, I think there's something, for instance, about the way that our email server is set up, where when it sees an email coming from a website, which is what it, what happens in this case, it it tends to to block some of those. And I think it did in this case. Well, it's, um, it's been seen before. And, you know, the interesting thing is here, it archives, of course, everybody's chat. And whoever it was that put in that unknown chat from an unknown email, when I logged off, like back on, that one is no longer in my chat now. And it was Ooh. something to do about... No, no, no. What was it? Something to do about the discussion on the cold air. Oh, no, that was Brandon. I don't know what it was about. I don't remember now. That was minutes ago. I forgot already. Um, so, okay. Well, good enough. We're set. Yep. Cool. Hey, Al, can you hear me? This is Steve Weigand. I just wanted to do a voice check. No, I can't hear you, Steve. I'm glad to hear that you can't hear me. That's good. <laughs> By the way, David, where's your picture? That cloud over that rock? That's really impressive. Where is that? Uh, that is Gibraltar. Oh, OK. I, I was standing uh, in a parking lot there. And uh, I was like, wow, this is a cool example. And everybody was like, it's just a cloud. <laughs> well, so no, you're was, a weather geek, right? Oh yeah, I mean it was it was pretty impressive, and uh, so I I was like I was shooting pictures of it to try to get the right angle. And, you know, come on, hurry, we need to get on the bus to go around to the other side, and blah blah blah. <laughs> but this one came out uh, the best. So yeah, that was Gibraltar about three years ago. We were on a cruise, and we were there for one day. Unfortunately, the meeting we were there, it had <laughs> just the right. Uh, Temperature uh, dew point spread, and the wind was coming from just the right direction there. So, well, it's a very cool picture. 
Yeah, and by the time, uh, in fact, the only thing that was a negative is I wanted to go up to the top of Gibraltar, and, and of course the cable car was in the cloud, and it did not scatter out until probably about 30 minutes before we were going to get back on the boat. So um, I didn't get to go up to the top, but I, I'm glad I got this instead of going up there. I think this is actually from the uh, airport, uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, the airport's interesting, and it's got a uh, road, the main road that goes out to the rock uh, and the town and everything goes right, cuts right across the middle of the uh, runway. <laughs> and, and, and there's a guard uh, at each side of the runway that, that has a, um, you know, a gate there, and, and they are in contact with the tower. And when there's an airplane that is like three or four minutes out on final, they uh, put the gates down and the roads closed, and, and it, it is the road. It's the only way to get out to the, the town of Gibraltar there. So again, we're in a tour bus and we're going across the runway and I'm sitting there snapping pictures left and right and everybody thought I was a nut uh, <laughs> because I was just, I thought that was the greatest thing. They said, well, I thought you were a weather geek. And I said, well, I'm a pilot too, you know? So uh, <laughs> that was, that was fascinating to, I knew it was coming. So I, I made sure and took the bus trip that went across the runway.
Joe Bracken, sound check part two, test one, two. Every now and then I pay attention. Yeah, and some of the other folks in the audience can hear you as well, so that sounds good on this end. Thank you, Disco. All right, according to my clock on the uh, on the laptop, which sometimes is wrong, it uh, does appear to be 140, so we'll uh, go ahead and get started. So this uh, uh, first session of the of the uh, afternoon, or I guess the middle session of the of the uh, the day, is on research and operate re, uh, research and development and transition. And so we've got a, a good lineup uh, uh, set up. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Bill Bauman from the FAA on uh, our research, uh, Doug Murphy from the FAA to talk about uh, uh, CSS weather and uh, uh, next gen weather uh, processor. Uh, from the uh, Global Systems Lab, we have uh, Steve Weigand. Uh, from uh, NASA Langley, Bill Smith, and Jason Levitt from the uh, 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 NSEP, and hopefully Josh Kasuth, but um, I, I hopefully we'll uh, we'll see him as well. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. And and uh, I haven't uh, got a particular lineup set up, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'm gonna. I'm going to put my boss on the spot first and uh, and have him talk. 
So uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Bill Bauman. Thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. And good afternoon, everybody. I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about um, where we are within the FAA, the Aviation Weather Division, what our role is and how we interact with other folks in the federal government. So <clears throat> first of all, the division is within the Office of Next Gen, which is a research organization. So that's our primary role. And we're part of the Portfolio Management and Technology Development Office. Um, but FAA weather is threaded out, threaded throughout the FAA's mission when you come right down to it. So even though we are the Aviation Weather Division, there are multiple FAA lines of business that touch weather in some way, shape, or form, which is one reason within the last year we established the FAA's weather community of interest, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more during this session. But basically the community of interest or any community of interest within the FAA is to share communication across those lines of business, basically break down the silos, which we've all heard of, especially in larger organizations. But the Aviation Weather Division in particular has four branches within it. So I mentioned we do conduct research because we're part of NextGen, but we do more than that. So I'll describe each branch just briefly here, the Weather Research Branch, which is headed by none other than Randy Bass, who just introduced me. And uh, his major programs are the Aviation Weather Research Program. And its main goal really is to deliver capabilities to the National Weather Service, mostly to Aviation Weather Center and the Environmental Modeling Center. A lot of our work focuses around those weather phenomena that would affect aviation, turbulence, icing, ceiling visibility, convection, and whatnot. And again, those capabilities are delivered through transition to AWC and to EMC. He also has the weather technology cockpit in the program. Um, the the WIDIC program, as the acronym says, is really to focus on general aviation for the most part. And instead of delivering a capability to the National Weather Service, to the other government entities, it's to private industry. And we do a lot of support with the GA community through outreach and through our research to deliver those capabilities over to private industry then to integrate back into the cockpit for the aviators. Our next branch is the New Weather Concept Development Branch, and Everett Whitfield is the manager there. And unlike what Randy's branch does to deliver capabilities to the National Weather Service specifically, the goal of our New Weather Concept Development Branch is really to deliver to the FAA, to deliver to our air traffic controllers, to provide a capability that's more of a decision support tool instead of delivering a meteorological project because you're delivering a capability to non-meteorologists, you want to deliver some sort of tool or capability that they can use. Also within the branch is our weather forecast improvement program, and they also lead our safety risk management, which is critical when we're deploying different technologies. We'll have a safety risk management panel, could be a one to three day meeting where we look at all the risks and get subject matter experts together and then hopefully approve that new technology to go into an operation. Our third branch is Weather Engineering and Evaluation Branch, and they're not in DC like the other four branches with headquarters. Uh, they're located at um, Atlantic City at our technical center, and Storm Agedigan is our branch manager there. Uh, one of their major programs, the Aviation Weather Demonstration and Evaluation, or AUDI program, um, as it says, they do a lot of demonstrations and evaluation. Um, they do surveys. They work very closely with Aviation Weather Center during their summer and winter experiments to test out new FAA technologies with the Aviation Weather Center and with National Weather Service forecasters. They also manage the Weather Observation Improvements Program. They have um, locations at the Atlantic City Airport with sensors that they do testing on. And one of the main programs they're working on right now under WOI is a new present weather sensor for ASOS. They also support next-gen weather processor, the other NWP, not numerical weather prediction, and common support services weather, CSS weather. And the last branch I'll talk about is our policy and requirements branch that's headed by Pat Murphy. In there lies our international program where we deliver capability and support the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO. Our space weather program, working closely with the National Weather Service Space Weather Prediction Center, 
and Office of Science and Technology Policy Space Weather Operations and Research Mitigation Team, otherwise known as SWARM. Uh, the interesting thing about this branch is that it's our requirements branch. So requirements coming into the division and going out of the division are run through the policy and requirements branch. Our requirements from the FAA come from AGV organization, our mission support, and we also levy requests onto the National Weather Service to try and support those requirements we have. And the other major program is the new ATM weather transition program and policy and requirements branch. So who do we work with? Uh, internally within the FAA, as I mentioned, especially through our weather COI, but even before we had that community of interest, we work with flight standards, aviation safety, uh, our program management organization, air traffic services, system operations, mission support, commercial space, Basically, any organization within the FAA that produces weather, consumes weather, or researches weather, we work with internally. How about externally? Well, we work closely with NOAA National Weather Service, as I already mentioned. At headquarters, it's the Aviation and Space Weather Services Branch, which is in Silver Spring, and then Aviation Weather Center, of course, in Kansas City. We also work with NOAA Global Systems Lab, GSL in Boulder, with the Aviation Weather Research Program. So they do a lot of the modeling work for us that we deliver to the Aviation Weather Center as EMC, as I mentioned earlier. Our other main research partners are our FFRDC partners, our federally funded research development corporation, like NCAR, MIT Lincoln Lab, and MITRE. Most of the research conducted under the Aviation Weather Research Program is done by those three organizations. And then we work with other federal agencies, DOD, specifically Air Force Weather, a lot of collaboration, and also NASA quite a bit lately on UAS work. I think I'll leave it there and uh, turn it back over to Randy. All right, uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, next, we'll uh, move on to uh, Doug Murphy from the uh, uh, FAA's Program Management Office on uh, uh, kind of what they do and, and the research they're conducting. So, uh, Doug, are you on? I, I'm here, sorry, I did find my mute button. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, so, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, like Randy said, I actually support uh, Program Management Office, uh, Next Gen Weather Programs. Uh, common Support Services Weather and Next Gen Weather Processor, as Bill mentioned a minute ago. Uh, I, I dare say I might be the only meteorologist in the program management organization, uh, but I've been around for 10 years on, on the, in the group uh, supporting WARP and then Next Gen. Um, I'm going to start out with a little bit of program background for anybody that might be new uh, to FPA or, or us. Um, common Support Services Weather is our our FAA's is, is going to be our FAA's enterprise level um, system responsible for uh, acquiring and disseminating weather information from uh, the Weather Service as well as the next RADs, uh, Canadian radars, other sources, and then providing those uh, same data and and additional products that uh, our, our programs create out to our uh, consumers inside the FAA primarily as well as outside uh, our, our our NAS stakeholders. Um, and for the for the NWP, uh, so the next gen weather processor is responsible for uh, generating um, value added aviation weather products from those weather service products that we acquire and 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 other sources, and and providing those to our aviation stakeholders as well. Um, so that's a quick high level background on the two programs. Um, for our veterans who've been on FBAL and followed us for quite a few years. Uh, thank you for your patience while we continue to work to getting this operational. Uh, I know we've hit some turbulence in the last 12 to 18 months uh, on the programs. Um, however, uh, we recently uh, went through a baseline change approval um, and we are full steam ahead again, uh, working towards uh, a, a deployment here in about two years uh, in 2023. Um, small change to our baseline, which will reduce our footprint in our terminal environment. Um, we had planned to replace the ITWIS systems that are out there in the NAS. Uh, those will remain in place um, for the foreseeable future. That's the, the primary change in our baseline. 
other than that, everything else is pretty much the same. Um, FCSS Weather will still continue to provide um, all our data via SWIM uh, to our consumers, both inside and outside, uh, in uh, both the IWIXM uh, and as, as well as US WIX uh, formats and that CDF uh, formats as well. Um, quickly on timeline, we are looking at our key site in summer of 2023 now, uh, followed by about 12 to 18 months of testing there at the key sites uh, before we are officially declared operational uh, towards the mid to late 2024 uh, calendar year. Um, during that key site time, you will start seeing uh, data available on SWIM uh, out of CSS weather while we're testing. Um, but the official operational data is in 24. Um, and kind of keying on on the research topic, which we're supposed to be uh, we're, we're focused on here in this hour. Um, this initial release of the two programs, you'll see a few um, items that have transitioned out of research uh, that we're planning on implementing. Things such as uh, convective weather avoidance model, uh, which estimates uh, probability that pilots will change routes uh, due to convection. Um, and that will be implemented in, in our uh, initial deployment. Uh, another uh, area we, you all might be familiar with is our CWIS and COSPA, our zero to two hour precip forecast, as well as the two to eight hour precip forecast that COSPA provides. Those will be uh, incorporated into the NWP system, uh, along with model, I'm, I'm sorry, algorithm improvements uh, to those uh, forecasts uh, relative to the CWIS and COSPA. Uh, implementation now, which is actually still considered a prototype, even though it's been out there for a number of years and, and folks use it. Uh, we'll be operationalizing those officially as part of our implementation. Uh, and then lastly, another uh, example is the traffic flow impact uh, decision support tool, uh, which underwent uh, quite a bit of research. Um, it'll be implemented as a forecast confidence product coming out of NWP as well. Um, kind of looking forward beyond our initial uh, deployment, uh, our planning for our first enhancement is going to start ramping up here in the next year. Um, one key item that we are already have on our plate that we're planning on implementing is the offshore precip capability, which is out there. Uh, it's been tested out in uh, Houston centers, Miami center, New York center as well as San Juan, and it's gotten very positive re uh, feedback. What that does is that it extends the, the reach of the next rad into the Gulf of Mexico uh, and the Atlantic, uh, providing uh, extended precip mosaics that incorporate satellite-based and lightning-based uh, returns, uh, reflectivity returns. So that's one uh, item we know is going to be enhancement one. Um, obviously, there's a number of uh, um, research projects within ANG that are, are rapidly maturing um, and, and getting close to being fully ready to transition. And we will definitely consider um, anything and everything that we uh, need uh, and we'll probably have to prioritize in that first enhancement. But uh, just know that uh, there's a lot of work in that area and a lot of coordination that we're doing with ANG. Um, and we do also follow AWC as well and, and the Weather Service in, in their research as well. So. Um, a lot of exciting plans. Finally, I think we're on the right track and we're just a couple couple years away from finally becoming operational. And I think I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you, Doug. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, uh, Bill Smith from uh, NASA Langley. And Bill is the... Uh, 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 works in the uh, climate science branch there and the uh, is the uh, cloud uh, working group lead and give me just a second and I will load up your presentation Bill. Thank you Randy. Yeah so appreciate the opportunity Randy and uh, I, I did not survey you know all of the aviation weather related research that's being done uh, within NASA so Undoubtedly, there's some activity at some of the other centers, um, you know, particularly uh, NASA Marshall, where they have the uh, sport program, um, and uh, probably some of the other centers. But I'm just going to focus on uh, research that's being done in the uh, science directorate here at Langley, uh, which is where I work. 
And uh, a lot of our activities are really um, um, driven by uh, NASA's climate program. So most of our work supports climate research, but over the years, and, and I guess mainly this started uh, through NASA's Applied Sciences program about uh, 15 years ago, um, we've been motivated to try and um, transition some of these uh, cloud data products in particular to uh, operational users. And um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And the system that we developed over the last 20 years or so is called the, the SAT Core. And um, it's, it's a real time system that we operate um, that ingests uh, satellite imager data. Uh, from various weather satellites, and uh, we run retrieval algorithms on that to um, quantify uh, atmosphere and surface conditions with, again, a focus on clouds, um, and this is using measurements that are taken from satellite in the visible near-infrared and uh, infrared. So we do this globally now and uh, actually analyze the, the entire constellation of geostationary operational satellites, not all satellites, but these five here um, are, are the primary ones that we analyze that, that give us the global coverage uh, from GEO. You can see the which satellites those are there. Um, and uh, we're actually expanding our system now um, to try and stitch these data together with um, the polar orbiting satellite data, because we also derive cloud properties from these satellites. That's Those are mainly for our science. Our, uh, climate programs, so MODIS and VIRS data from the polar orbiters and AVHRR. But the goal here is to stitch all this together into um, a global gridded composite. It's going to be at three kilometer resolution and at 30 or 60 minute resolution. Um, and I think it's going to be a really nice product for um, uh, you know the science community, particularly model modelers that are looking for a global data sets to evaluate models and um, develop machine learning capabilities for various uh, things. So uh, on the lower left here, you can see some of the um, uh, cloud parameters that we derive. Um, you know, first we, we run a fairly complex cloud mask uh, to identify which clouds or which pixels are clear and cloudy. And then um, we derive the cloud optical thickness and effective radius using theoretically based uh, methods and these provide important information on the density and size distribution of cloud water and ice um, in the atmosphere and uh, the optical depth that we derive during the daytime is also an important parameter because it gives us some information on the geometric uh, cloud thickness so it kind of gives us a, a, a vertical dimension to the retrievals that we derive and we can use that to estimate cloud ceilings when subtracted from the uh, derived cloud top heights um, so we've developed algorithms over the years that, that utilize these information to, to try and diagnose various aviation weather hazard, hazards, and we make these uh, data available for anyone to use. And, and these are shown in red here, so um, cloud ceilings, uh, airframe icing, also uh, the, the high ice water content icing, and uh, we've got some uh, convection products uh, as well. And of course, we really uh, value our collaborations with the FAA and the National Weather Service and Aviation uh, Weather Center uh, to work collectively to evaluate and improve these data and try and advance them into aviation weather tools. So that's ongoing work that we're currently involved uh, with. And that aspect, trying to get these data into you know uh, operational systems, is not that easy to do. Um, and so, while you know we want to. Uh, exploit the satellite observation advantages as much as we can, which is really the, the spatial and temporal resolution geographic coverage that we get from satellites. There are a lot of, you know, outstanding issues with uh, satellite retrievals um, under some conditions that have high uncertainties, and, and these can certainly complicate or even prevent uh, their use, um, their confident use in operations. So we spend a considerable amount of our time uh, our research time uh, validating our data products with, you know, field campaign data, aircraft measurements, uh, um, pilot reports are an important data set that we utilize. And of course, the active sensor data, data, the LIDARs and radars at surface sites and from satellites are really critical as well. And um, so, 
you know, our, our ongoing research is very focused on continuing to try and advance these data products by improving their accuracies and their consistencies at all times of, of day so that they can be used more confidently. Um, we're also interested in um, trying to improve the utility of the satellite data products for weather forecasting. So most of what I've talked about so far is just diagnosing clouds and, and trying to diagnose aviation weather hazards. But obviously we want to be able to forecast these things accurately as um, as well. So we've been collaborating uh, for quite a long time with Steve Wygant and his colleagues at uh, uh, NOAA GSD and um, that's actually led to some of our cloud data products being assimilated into uh, weather forecast models, uh, both at GSD and uh, NSAP. And then another thing that we're trying to do, um, we're currently implementing a new capability within the SAC core uh, to try and take advantage of uh, atmospheric sounding data, which is, um, I would say, um, quite underutilized in uh, numerical weather prediction right now. And um, so the sounding data, of course, provides profiles of atmospheric thermodynamics, and um, these data can be assimilated into weather forecast models. And um, we're trying to advance that capability and really investigate the impacts of these data on weather forecasting. So I'll come back to that in just a second real briefly. Um, so Randy, can you hit the next slide for me, please? So. Real briefly, I, I've listed here some of the research activities that we're currently conducting um, really targeted towards improving satellite data products and their utility and various applications, including uh, aviation weather. And, and so there, there's sort of three themes here. I mean, one is one is data fusion. No single sensor tells us everything we need to know. So we found that um, fusing data with other sensors can really take us to the next level from an accuracy and utility standpoint. Um, so for example, one thing that we're really missing in our sort of standard retrievals is information on cloud vertical structure. And I won't go into to details on that, but if we include, if we, if we fuse data that um, uh, garners information on cloud vertical structure, like from the active sensors and microwave radiometers and even cloud models themselves, we can derive more um, accurate cloud properties from satellite that, that are more, um, consistent with what we say get out of models. And so that actually helps um, put the models and the satellite data sort of on the same playing field and, and hopefully uh, in the future could lead to more advanced uh, assimilation of satellite uh, cloud data products. Um, let's see what else. Um, we're also using textural information um, to improve various products like the convective products, overshooting tops, and the textual information also helps us, um, you know, QC the data and, and, and improves the interpretation of the drive products. And then we started to throw machine learning at some of the more challenging problems. And, and this is, um, we're starting to see some really nice improvements with. And um, so, for example, addressing uh, multi layered clouds, which we typically, you know, the, in traditional methods, we tended to ignore. Um, cloud detection and retrieval uncertainties over snow and ice, quite difficult, but machine learning is, is helping us with that. And then, you know, we have large inconsistencies between what we can derive in the daytime and what we can derive at night when we only have infrared uh, satellite imagery data. And so machine learning is actually helping us to derive much more consistent and more accurate nighttime cloud properties that are uh, uh, quite consistent with what we get during the daytime. Um, so uh, the, the example shown here is actually just our, our icing product. This is a global gridded analysis that we put out. And it's actually a good example of how these, these various activities on the left have led to maturation over time of, of, of our products. Um, here for icing, you know, from something that, you know, 20 years ago was really only useful for identifying super cool liquid water in the tops of low level clouds to now a product that provides information uh, on the icing potential and severity under all cloud conditions, and now even more consistently um, at all times of day. So uh, the next slide, Randy. So finally, I'm just going to jump back real quick to this kind of new area of work that we're delving into, um, which is the atmospheric thermodynamics and winds. And we are in the process of implementing a satellite sounding data retrieval and assimilation system within the 
sat core. And, and one of the reasons we're doing that is uh, the researchers that have been doing this in partnership with NASA for um, some a few years now um, have developed a system that's really unique because it, it exploits the full information content in hyperspectral radiances. Um, we're talking about thousands of channels of information. And we're getting this information right now from Chris and Yazi, which are hyperspectral sensors on the polar orbiting satellites, but this is soon going to be available from geostationary satellites. The Chinese are actually already flying uh, polar hy or uh, hyperspectral sounders on geos, and then the Europeans will launch uh, uh, a sounding instrument on a geo in, uh, I think, two years. And the U.S., unfortunately, is lagging quite a ways behind. It'll probably be 2030 before we have that capability over the U.S. But, um, you know, the operational centers are um, assimilating some of these information, but they're not fully exploiting these data. Um, they're really only assimilating a small fraction of the information, which is really contrary to why these um, sounding instruments were developed. Um, and that's really leading to limited impacts of these data in uh, numerical weather weather prediction. So what we want to do is evaluate, you know, through the system that we're um, implementing the impact of the satellite thermodynamics profile assimilation on wind analyses and forecasts. And we are getting some pretty impressive results so far. Uh, there's a plot on the right actually that shows uh, the results of the assimilation system compared to RAOBS. These are root mean standard differences. So the red is about a factor of two um, more accurate than say the control run that doesn't assimilate the satellite data. And it's quite a bit more accurate even than the atmospheric uh, motion tracking methods that are shown in green here. Um, so it's a nice a nice pickup there in accuracies. Um, of course, um, there's a lot of potential here for severe weather forecasting. We have a strong interest in understanding when we assimilate these atmospheric thermodynamic uh, information how do we improve cloud and icing analyses and forecasts? So we want to do that kind of research to try and quantify that. And then we also have a contrail uh, research program here at Langley. And one of the things we're interested in using these data for is predicting, or uh, I should say diagnosing, first of all, but then through modeling, predicting uh, the conditions where contrails would form. And this is to investigate the possibility of, you know, providing uh, meteorological data sets for contrail avoidance. Should that, uh, you know, ever be a strategy that's uh, uh, adopted? So th that's all I have. I, I hope I didn't go too long. Uh, thanks again, Randy, and I'll, I'll uh, pass it back to you. All right, thank you very much, Bill. Our next speaker is Stephen Weigand from uh, the Global Systems Lab. And Thanks, Randy. I hope you can all hear me. And um, we could queue up. I, I made just a few slides. I tried to not get too excessive, as we like to do. Um, I think most of you know. Um, I'm the. I work at GSL. I'm the uh, deputy division chief in AVID, which is the Assimilation Verification Innovation Division. And we also work very closely with another division at GSL, which is EPAD, the um, Environmental Prediction Advancement Division. And so they kind of do the modeling and the physics, and we do the data simulation and the verification. So we're kind of more obcentric. And those two pieces really work together. And, and, and the work we've done with the FAA is, is noted by Bill earlier, is under the Aviation Weather Research Program. And I'm the GSL, um, uh, focal point for one of the so-called product development teams, the model development enhancement team. And we've worked a lot on modeling over the years, going back even to the RUC and then the RAP and the HER and, and um, doing development, research and development, and then transition to operations um, for those systems. We work very closely with the other product development teams. Um, there's one's focus on different aviation hazards, icing, convection, turbulence, and as noted, a lot of those are at, at, how is it, NCAR or, or MIT or other places. We also work very closely with NSEP, both with EMC and NCO. A lot of development work shared with Environmental Modeling Center, and, and pleased to see that, that Jason Lovell will be talking next. And then also with the, uh, Network Central Operations for the implementations, and EMC and NCO work very closely together too, and these 
these uh, big model operational implementations are pretty big deals with a lot of testing and evaluation that goes into them. And we've done, uh, since the first wrap in 2012 and the first HER in 2014, we've hit a combined wrap HER implementation every two years in 2016, 2018, and 2020 was the latest one. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and we've done a lot of innovation, both in the model physics and the data assimilation. And, and I'll kind of highlight a few of those things, but they really work together because you need the good physics so the model's not veering off course so that the data simulation can make the kind of the small adjustments um, needed. And, 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 and so we'll talk about that, but we're also now at a big transition point is we're moving towards this new system, this, this rapid refresh forecast system or RRFS, sometimes we refer to it as the RUFUS. And that's going to be a major implementation and it transitions um, into a more unified model. And it's currently slated for late in, in FY23. It's a big ambitious project with a lot of work. So there's some chance that may slide to the right. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. If you could go on to the next slide, Randy. Um, and I want to talk just a little bit about the, the, the work we've done and, and the capabilities we've brought along. And again, it's really been an ongoing set of innovations, but as I said, in both model physics and data simulation. And I could show a lot of different examples. I showed just one example here. It's mostly a, a data simulation one, but it, it, there's actually a lot of model physics that go into this as well, in terms of getting the boundary layer and the near surface temperatures right for the, having the right cape. This is a case from the Iowa derecho back in August of 2020. And it shows the, the then operational HER-V3 on the bottom with the, the, the HER-V4, which was in final testing before it was impl implemented a few months later. And while the HER-V3 did a pretty good job of this system, um, and these are really hard to forecast systems because typically it's a very, very um, capped environment just south of the storm. And a lot of times the models seriously have the convection is elevated. And so they just don't get the evolution of the systems right. But you can see the HER did a better job of capturing just the little details of, 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 of the bow echo with the comma head um, up in northeastern Iowa. And then that translates into improved wind forecast. This is a, a run model, a, a, a sum over the whole model run through 21Z of the of the, the 10 meter wind. You can see the, the streaks of the more intense winds in the new model. So this kind of shows that the things we've done both in the data simulation and the physics to, to continually improve the forecast. And, and, and that's been a lot of the goal of our work, but also to work with the other uh, stakeholders, both these product development teams, but also uh, um, AWC and the other stakeholders to, to help them know how to best use the grids and facilitate the, the use of, of the model guidance, which underpins a lot of these um, um, hazard uh, products that, that are produced for, for aviation. And again, a big part of this has been work with ensembles, and that's increasing. It seems like throughout a lot of my career, the, the promise of ensembles and on uncertainty information has just been around the corner, and there's been a lot of work to make that become a reality. But I think that is going to become a reality, and it helps in, in, in with some of the AI and the machine learning techniques that are coming online to where there really is a lot of uncertainty information in the ensembles and we can be able to harness that to, to enable decision making for ha specific hazards. A few of the other things that we've brought along, um, we improved our, our cloud and our um, ceiling forecast a lot with HER-V4. It was underdone a lot in HER-V3. It, it, sometimes maybe it's a little overdone it, and, and Josh, you, Below, you noted a lot of things about Alaska that were pretty interesting. Of course, the, the data sparseness is a key factor that we see in the data assimilation. Um, but in general, we, we, we think that the, the, the ceiling visibility forecasts are improved quite a bit. We also added um, the smoke field, and that's been used quite a bit across a lot of different applications and in, improves uh, our, our, our visibility forecast. And there's been a lot of work on kind of coupling aerosol data simulation and, and whatnot to improve that. And a lot of that is satellite based. And, and, and Bill, it was nice to see you talk about the work that you've done in at NASA and we've, as you noted, assimilated a lot of your cloud products and there's a lot of really good information 
in that. And especially as we go to bigger domains, I'll show you in a minute, this rapid refresh domain is going to be three kilometers over a, a, a domain that's pretty close to as big as the RAP used to be. And so there's a lot of oceanic regions where the satellite data are really going to figure even more prominently. And we've also done some work looking at combining the, the GOES cloud top information with, with the polar orbiter, which which of course it isn't, you know, it isn't doesn't have the frequency that the GOES does, but it, it's good resolution data and the combining of them is really nice. And we appreciate the work you've done for a lot of the things like the in situ observations, the aircraft data and whatnot, we, we want to take the direct observation, but for things like radar data in, in the satellite data, the, the, the products you put together with the coverage are really nice. And, and, and your, your global one, I'll say something about that in a minute, it really looks like a promising thing in, in, in terms of us moving forward. Um, and again, we've worked with the partners uh, and we'll continue to do that as we move into this Rufus era, because it's a pretty big transition. Um, the grids are pretty big. And, and Josh Shrek, you made a comment, I think it was you, about the the, the data volumes, and they're going to be even bigger with the Rufus, and that's going to be a pretty big issue. And maybe that's a good point. Thank you to go to this next slide, Randy. Um, if we are moving to this new new um, unified system, the rapid refresh forecast system, and we're working even more closely with EMC. Uh, my boss, Curtis Alexander and Jacob Carley at EMC are heading up this effort, and it's really going to be a, 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 a transition, a, a, a big upgrade in capabilities with this big three kilometer domain that's roughly this yellow area that will encompass the area covered by the the, the her alaska and the conus her and it will give us a unified solution even out to a lot uh, hawaii so we don't have to have all these different posted size um grids we also it will have a 10 member ensemble and that will give us a really good capability to do probabilistic forecasts and feed into um machine learning type post-processing that we think can be really helpful and and that's part of this greater coupling that we're going to have in terms of working with the other um, um, groups and stakeholders to 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 make better post -proce processing of the grids, and, and along those lines, the satellite data is really going to be helpful. And some of the trends that kind of dovetail off of this, I note at the bottom, um, we're, we're kind of moving. I'll go to that second one to um, hourly cycle and even looking at global rapid refresh models. And so that's where that product that you mentioned, Bill, will really helpful for that. And, and some of the, the the DA data simulation processes could just be better handled with the, a bigger grid because you can get the longest wavelengths across the grid. And so we think in the next 10 years, there will be an, an hourly cycle of global rapid refresh. And so we're going to want all those satellite data to really help that. The other direction we've been pushing in is kind of the other end is really high resolution, uh, less than one kilometer horizontal resolution, and it's significantly enhanced vertical resolution, especially in the boundary layer. And this is going to be pretty key, I think, for the, the UAS applications. It's also good for, for real localized. We've been looking at fog formation and, and low cloud formation around San Francisco and, and, and seeing some evidence that the one kilometer grid does a better job getting the terrain details. And we can also picture really small scale um, um, uh, grids of less than one kilometer around airport hubs to try and get like wind shifts you know, across the runways and that sort of thing. And then as I mentioned, the application of the AI best tech based techniques for enhanced um, ensemble post-processing and, and then um, um, the other thing we'll see is increased working with the other centers. And then we've been testing some cloud computing, and, and this isn't something that's going to happen right away, but just with these huge data sets and the grid volumes, we think that's a trend that will be increasing um, over the next few years. And so lots of different areas. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss with various stakeholders here at this meeting. Thank you. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, our next speaker, you know, is uh, all the uh, research in the world doesn't do you any good if you can't transition it uh, to operations. So our next speaker is Jason Levitt from uh, uh, NCEP ENC. And Jason, if you're on, I will get your slides up. Or Great, slide. Thanks. thanks. Yeah, I've just got one slide. All right, should be up. 
All right, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so I just put together a few bullet points here to describe what we do. Um, I think probably uh, here at EMC, we don't need a, a whole ton of introduction. You all use uh, our data quite extensively, but I can uh, speak to a little bit about uh, just what we do and what's what's here at the branch and uh, specifically to some of the aviation weather support that we do and, and talk a little bit about that with respect to the, the subject matter of the panel. So, hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Levitt. I'm the branch chief for the verification, post-processing and product generation branch here at EMC. It's one of the three branches at the Environmental Modeling Center, the uh, model development branch being the other one, uh, one, of the other one of the other three, and then uh, the engineering and implementation branch uh, being the, the other, the three EIB. Uh, so uh, you all know us pretty well. You know, we develop, implement, and maintain uh, the suite of all of the uh, numerical environmental model forecasts uh, for the United States. And uh, we develop these uh, with uh, thousands of people across the country and internationally as well too. Uh, partners like Steve Wygant, who just, uh, who just chatted uh, about his work at GSL, and uh, along with uh, several of you that are on the uh, on, the, on the call today. Uh, so uh, quite a bit of work that we do, of course, we currently have uh, 22 separate modeling systems and a lot of other derived product systems from that. I can't remember what the exact count is of all of our separate applications, but I think a number somewhere in the 40s. So that's a lot to support. <laughs> so we have a, a lot of products that we support uh, going all the way back uh, decades that are still in operations all the way to new things that we're designing and implementing as well too in support of aviation weather. So specifically to this branch here, uh, the verification and post-processing branch. Uh, so verification is what uh, you, you would think it would be quality control, making sure that the, the systems that are operating currently in operations and the new ones that are about to come online are evaluated well and that they're operating uh, to specifications uh, for uh, what we need them to do for predicting across uh, the country and across the globe. And then post-processing and product generation, that's all the, uh, scientific work that goes into regridding the data uh, that you're able to download and see to derive variables like CAPE, lift and index, things like that, uh, to post other post-processing, to physical post-processing calibration, to product generation, which is a little bit more of the technical end. That's making sure we've got the right WMO headers on the data, uh, that it's in the right data format like RIP2 or NetCDF and all the documentation associated with that. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of a hybrid of, of both of of science and then computer science as well to make sure that we have all the, the technical end covered so it can be transmitted out over all of our various transmission networks like the satellite broadcast network, the SBN, as well as the internet as well too, and can be decoded properly on your end uh, that receives it. Uh, looks like the slideshow ended, Randy, if we could um, go back to the slide. Looks like uh, something happened here, a technical glitch. Live TV is a bear, Jason. Say that again. Live TV is a real beast. It is, it is right? <laughs> I guess something occurred here. Um, so I can keep talking while, while Randy gets that back up. I actually have the slide up here. Um, I'll put it over on my other screen here so I can just talk to it. So um, uh, some of the other things that we do here uh, specifically for uh, aviation support uh, would be uh, supporting the international treaty efforts that we have uh, with the United Nations that support the ICAO and uh, the World Area Forecast Systems. You know them as WAS products. That would be the things that come out of uh, the Global Forecast System, the GFS, and then the RAPER, turbulence, icing, uh, visibility, those specialized products that are blended with the UK. Now, these are really important products. We know the airlines uh, use them quite extensively as well uh, as other parts of industry. And so we have a, a lot of dedicated resources to those, uh, specifically just to those products within the branch here at EMC. So uh, we spend quite a bit of time working on the new algorithms and uh, with our partners and uh, putting that across the fence from research to operations uh, with each new upgrade. So every time we change the GFS or the RAPHER to a new dynamic core or to more vertical levels, we have to retune those algorithms, which takes quite a bit of work with our partners. So um, that's something that we're very committed to. Um, the model suite, as like I said, it produces all the aviation, specific aviation variables that uh, you can Uh, cloud cover, uh, things like that, uh, besides just the, the icing turbulence and uh, ceiling visibility that uh, that you're you're used to looking at the most. So um, the, the full range of, of data that you need to make forecasts for aviation. 
Uh, Steve mentioned this and a couple others have as well. So here at EMC, uh, one of the, the biggest projects we're working on with a lot of our partners is uh, evolving the prediction suite to a smaller set of applications, the 22 or so applications that we have to maintain and constantly update uh, is way more than what we currently have resources for. And it's certainly as computers become more complicated and we're dealing with more, um, more uh, issues associated with having to transition those to operations as those systems get older and are frozen and don't change in their science or don't change in their data simulation, uh, the O&M tail for those uh, products and, and systems increases exponentially. So we're going to be consolidating systems down. Steve mentioned one of them, the RFS, that's going to take over uh, the RAP and the HER and, uh, and several of the other modeling systems. Uh, down the road from that will be a new uh, coupled ocean atmosphere system merging the GFS and the GEFs, as well as subsuming the NAM and the SHREF um, a, a year or year and a half after that. So these systems will be consolidating down some of the legacy frozen systems that occur and going through a major upgrade to the new dynamic core, to new post-processing systems, and to new grids. And uh, Steve illustrated that pretty well for the RFS in his last slide. Uh, so lots going on in terms of what we're doing here at EMC uh, with our partners, uh, the unified forecast system, bringing those applications over. Um, over the next several years, we're going to see consolidations, uh, major upgrades uh, to science and post-processing uh, for those systems. So. Uh, uh, fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> it's, we're going to have a lot of changes coming. And two great things about that is upgrading the science and the post-processing. So we're up to the, the latest and greatest. Some of these frozen systems like the SHREF and the NAM, which have been around for a long time, but we're not changing the science, will go away to upgrade the science. And then at the opposite end too, we should hopefully reduce our O&M costs by getting rid of a lot of these singular systems and reducing down the footprints uh, in terms of what we support and develop here at EMC so that uh, we can focus more of our efforts on the development and increasing the science rather than on the large O&M costs. So um, I will end there and pass it back to Randy for the next person. Thanks everybody. All right, uh, thanks, Jason, um, and sorry for the uh, uh, technical glitch there. As I, uh, uh, you know, if you're sharing your screen in in full presentation mode, you can't see anything else. And I was trying to bring up the Teams icon, and it shut down everything else. So, uh, apologize for that. Is uh, no worries. No worries. Thanks, Randy. So is uh, Josh Kasuf online? I don't believe he is. All right. Well, uh, that uh, that concludes the, uh, the the panelists. Now let's uh, go to the questions. So I'll uh, pass it over to Dave. Hey, thanks, Randy. Um, we had several come in. Let me um, uh, take them kind of in reverse order here. Uh, for Doug Murphy, um, this is from Matt. From your perspective, do you think that the weather products needed by the FAA and operators? and are produced by the FAA are sufficiently different from similar products generated by the Weather Service in order to justify them. Uh, so to answer your question, Matt, I think the answer is yes. I think uh, the, the algorithms within the FAA that we're developing are primarily focused on translating weather data that uh, Weather service and other sources produce. Um, as, as everyone's probably aware, most air traffic controllers don't have time to interpret weather, and um, our algorithms that we were primarily focused within the FAA would make their life easier or more easy to interpret and more quickly interpret weather information uh, in the form form of say, like we talked about earlier, convective weather avoidance uh, based on. Um, air traffic history and, and probabilities. Um, I think that's primarily where most of our work is focused on in the FA side um, with, with those types of products that perform that kind of translation that connection from raw weather data and having to interpret to not to uh, making decisions, uh, both tactical and strategic in traffic management.
Dave, you're muted. You're muted, Dave. Sorry. Um, and Matt, did that satisfy your question there? Yeah. I'm just um, um, just teeing up a conversation, see if anybody wants to jump in. And, and I think I have one more for, for Doug here. It was from uh, Robert Bonham, and it didn't say who it was toward, but it sounds like it was maybe you. It was, uh, how do you plan on operationalizing OPC from a production perspective? And uh, we are still working on that in the uh, airports with GSWR. So yeah. I think that was part of you. Yeah, I, I believe it was. It came in during my my topic, so um, I would be lying if I if I said we've figured it completely out. Uh, I think we're in a similar situation uh, as uh, you folks at the Air Force. Um, so to date, um, all our evaluations uh, in those facilities across the Gulf of Mexico and East Coast, um, we've provided them this OPC information on separate displays. Um, and one thing we've heard loud and clear is, hey, we would like to have these integrated into our uh, scopes and our, so that we can actually see it on our scope and be able to um, real time route uh, flights. So I think that's going to be one of the main uh, things that we have to make sure we implement properly, uh, integrated into our automation systems. And we'll definitely have a lot of work with the air traffic control uh, community and NACA um, in, in uh, figuring out how we do that. And there's other questions we still have. Um, I think we're a long way from from fully figuring out how we implement it, uh, to be completely frank. And uh, if I could expand on the earlier part, Doug, that you answered for Matt's question, I agree completely that the FAA's focus is to support um, our controllers with translated capability. So that would be decision support tools and whatnot, as I mentioned. But on the other hand, which is part of another question about federal agencies sharing, um, the FAA funded the HER development. And we did that because we were selfish and we wanted better uh, aviation hazards to be able to be forecast with higher resolution, such as turbulence, icing, convection, C and V and whatnot. But aviation certainly isn't the only group using the HER. It's widely used by people for forecasting severe weather, fire weather, marine weather, and whatnot. So while the FAA certainly we're developing, as Doug said, our own capabilities to support our controllers, a lot of the work that we've done for aviation has flowed out to other components outside of aviation in other parts of the, the federal government too. So there's a pretty good sharing there of our capabilities. So, so I hope that helps since you said we were having an open conversation. That, that was great, Bill. And Doug. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And and that was um, there. There was a uh, question to all the panel uh, members about uh, the sharing of information. Uh, before I open it up to the other panelists on that, uh, this is probably a simple question here, and I don't want to get lost in the mix. Bob Abgen had a question back to uh, Bill Smith about what was the vertical resolution of your wind product? Yeah, sorry. Um, in that configuration, uh, to be honest, I don't remember. I think it might have been um, on the order of um, 25 millibars. But yeah, I, I I I don't I don't really know the exact answer. It's 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 a decent resolution. It's configurable to you know the resolution you want. It, it it's a wharf based uh, system. I don't know if that helps. And and maybe Bob, uh, if you uh, want to discuss that uh, additionally here, if you can uh, maybe reach out directly to Bill. Um, yeah, I can get that information. Uh, so, so back to the remainder of the panelists, uh, Matthias did tee up a conversation here with to what extent and how our aviation weather has a characteristic characterization algorithms shared across federal agencies, uh, such as NOAA and the Air Force. And I think Bill touched on that. And so uh, we'll open it to the other panelists here to 
uh, respond. I can add one small part of this, and, and this is somebody I meant to mention and um, didn't get in, but there's been work supported by the FAA to, to take some of the, the, the downstream algorithms like the, the forecast icing potential FIP and GTG, the turbulence one, and move them more into the the model post process or the UPP that Jason knows well about the universal post processing system. And we think that's a good thing because they use other data sources as well, but they use a lot of model output and that just kind of moves it into a more streamlined way. And we also think that'll dovetail well into making use of the ensemble data as it comes out. Um, so I think that's been a, one bit of progress in this area. Any other uh, panelists? I, th I think just expanding on that a little bit, um, Steve, it made me remember that not only do we share it among federal agencies, but also with private industry. So the GTG Nowcast, for example, those fields are available to anybody that wants to get them from NCAR. Hopefully we're going to get them over to Weather Service uh, at some point here, but right now you can request that from NCAR and those fields are available for the Nowcast, the, the 15 minute update of uh, graphical turbulence guidance. So the algorithms are being shared um, outside of the federal agency as well uh, in the form of uh, model output fields that are available to stakeholders that want to use it. And I think there are about a dozen or so that subscribe to the GTGN, including the commercial airlines. This is Matthias, if I may chime in a little more on elaborating why I posed this question, is when I was listening to Captain Shane Cox, and I don't know if he's still on, he was saying that the Air Force is a backup for the Aviation Weather Center and potentially the, the Storm Prediction Center if they go down. And so if you suddenly switch products from one provider to another that uses different models, potentially different post-processing uh, procedures, I wonder how different those products are. And if you have some sharing of the capabilities, then that might help bring them closer in nature. All right, well, it's uh, basically 20 minutes to three. So uh, um, I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, very insightful, and very informative. Um, a lot of interesting questions and, and that that question about, you know, the um, you know, collaboration and, and making sure that they're, you know, <laughs> the uh, they work together is is a good one. And it's something that uh, I think Sometimes we struggle with. Um, sometimes it doesn't turn out to be as big a problem as as we thought. But uh, but especially when we start looking at um, you know integrating things from from uh, NASA Langley or or uh, you know some of our I wouldn't say non traditional but but the groups that we haven't worked with as much in the past like uh, you know NCAR and Lincoln. Um, that those those questions are going to become more relevant and things are going to have to take a look at so um continue to ask your questions but uh let's take a 10 minute break before we get uh, started on the uh, last session of the day